about methods, models, and perspectives. I'm the moderator, Andrew Hendry from McGill University. Uh, the questioner who is monitoring the question board, um, we expect to be uh, in bar Mayan, but uh, you can also direct your questions to Michael Whitlock, uh, either through the Slack channel or on Zoom. So the first speaker is Thomas Hitchcock, uh, who will speak to us on a gene's eye view of sexual antagonism. Go for it, Thomas. Cool. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Is that all good? Yeah. Okay, fab. Uh, yep, yeah, so I'm Tom Hitchcock, and uh, I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing recently on sexual antagonism, and in particular with a focus on different forms of haplodiploidy. Uh, so before I begin, I uh, just want to thank some people who've been involved in this work, um, Andy and Laura, who are the kind of co-authors of this, Andy based at the University of St Andrews and Laura based over at the University of Edinburgh, as well as Jack, Sam, uh, the rest of the Gardner group in the Theory Lab for really helpful discussions and the University of St Andrews for giving money. Okay, so males and females have distinct reproductive strategies and this may lead them to having distinct optima over a range of traits, whether it be morphological, physiological, behavioral, uh, or so on. And so here we've got two particularly striking examples. On the left, we have the rusty tussock moth with these slight winged males and these slightly plumper uh, wingless females. And on the right, we have the humpback anglerfish which have this display this extreme sexual dimorphism in size. The kind of main fish you can see is a, is a female, and I've ringed here the much smaller parasitic dwarf male. But nonetheless, although males and females might have distinct phenotypic optima over a range of traits, they nonetheless share essentially the same genome. And this may lead to trade-offs between attaining high fitness in females and in males. And this trade-off is uh, commonly known as sexual antagonism or sometimes under the name of intralocus sexual conflict. So most of the work that's been done on this has focused on diploid organisms, but today I'm gonna to focus mostly on haplodiploidy. Uh, so these organisms account for about 15% of all animal species and span a wide range of genera, uh, everything from their nematode groups that are haplodiploid to rotifers. And here we have some springtails fungus gnats, wasps, uh, scale insects, thrips, and even ambrosia beetle there in the bottom right. And so all these organisms are united by this asymmetric inheritance system where males only pass on their maternal origin genes. But this can come in slightly different forms. So in particular, there's kind of two forms of haplodiploidy that I'm gonna talk about today. On the left, we have our anatoki, which we might think of as kind of classic haplodiploidy, uh, where females are formed from fertilized eggs. So contain both maternal origin, which I've got in the kind of block colour here, and paternal origin genes, which are the kind of the stripey gene that I've done here. In contrast to this, males are formed from unfertilised eggs and so only contain maternal origin genes. When they produce their gametes, correspondingly females can produce eggs containing both maternal origin genes and paternal origin genes, whilst males can only produce sperm containing paternal origin genes. In contrast to this, uh, another group of haplodiploid uh, organisms to have a system called paternal genome elimination. So initially, both males and females are both produced from fertilized eggs. And so initially contain both maternal origin and paternal origin genes. But at some point during development, it might be early on during embryogenesis or even late during spermatogenesis, males will eliminate their paternal genome, hence the name. And so subsequently, females will produce eggs containing both maternal origin genes and paternal origin genes, but males will only produce sperm containing paternal origin genes. So it's the transmission genetics that unite these organisms, but they often display distinct somatic and transmission genetics. Alongside their genetics, a lot of these organisms display characteristic social ecologies, and in particular, they often are associated with chronic inbreeding. So a nice example of this, here we have the date stone or button beetle here, uh, which as you might guess, feasts on date stones, uh, and so here we have a female will typically uh, find a date stone, she'll burrow into it, she'll dig her gallery and she'll lay a brood of her offspring. And these offspring will then often interbreed before the females disperse again. So this is an example of kind of, there'll be high levels of kind of uh, brother system mating in this system. 
So the kind of key questions we're interested in is firstly, how do these different combinations of transmission and somatic genetics affect haplodiploidy and sexual antagonism? Secondly, how do the different mating ecologies of some of these species affect sexual antagonism? And finally, how may this lead to conflicts over sexually antagonistic traits? So firstly, thinking about the transmission and somatogenetics, we've considered this fitness scheme here where we're considering the invasion of a sexually antagonistic allele. So we have two scenarios. Firstly, a male beneficial female costly scenario, and secondly, a female beneficial male costly scenario. So here T represents the cost and S represents the benefit. So we can see here are three possible female genotypes and our kind of three uh, groups of kind of possible male uh, fitnesses and the corresponding genotypes. So from this fitness scheme, we can then compute the invasion conditions and I've plotted these out here. So the solid line corresponds to the invasion boundary for a female beneficial allele and the dotted line for a male beneficial allele. So anything below, the, below these lines represents when the allele can invade from rarity. So starting on the left, we can see that for both male and female beneficial alleles invade under exactly the same circumstances, i.e. there's um, there's no particular bias towards either sex under diploidy, under classic diploidy, which I put a little tortoise here to represent that. In contrast, under male PG, what we see is this zone of feminization. And this is because for those pater under paternal genome elimination, there's a kind of twofold weighting upon the fitness of females because females contribute twice as much to the ancestry of the population as males do. And so we expect subsequently um, kind of feminization of the genome. Under Renatoki, not only do we see this twofold fitness effect of waiting, uh, twofold waiting on the fitness of females, we see the second effect, which is because males are haploid and females are diploid, typically fitness effects are greater in males than females. And this is particularly acute when mutations are on average recessive. And so we see as a, sub, as a consequence of this kind, of, this kind of zone of masculinization in the blue, but as mutations are on average dominant, then we see kind of feminization uh, once more. So we can see that these different somatic genetics alter the, um, alter the effect of, um, alter how sexual antagonism plays out under PG systems and um, the Arenotokis ones. So we can kind of simplify this somewhat and just plotting out the uh, female beneficial uh, boundary, we can kind of call this the potential for feminization. So if this is above one, we expect feminization of the genome. If it's below the one, we expect masculinization of the genome. And I'll follow this uh, from now on just for kind of simplicity. So secondly, we're going to be thinking about how some of the mating ecologies might alter sexual antagonism. So we've kind of devised this kind of life cycle, the simple life cycle to kind of capture uh, some of the ecology of these organisms. So initially juveniles are born onto a patch, then a proportion of these of the females of this patch will mate with their sibs. This proportion is S. Um, the rest of the females will then mate with the global pool of males. The females will disperse and find they'll be competition for breeding spots before we start the life cycle once more. So what we see is if we now allow for submating, then we are plotted out here, our Anatoki, male PG and diploidy. And so we see that as we increase the amount of submating, we get increasing amounts of feminization. So we can see that submating promotes feminization of the genome under all three of the mating system, all three of the genetic systems we've looked at here, our Anatoki, male PG and diploidy. And actually under additivity, we can see that for Aranatoki and diploidy are kind of actually identical. So why is this? Well, we can split this into kind of three types of effects. The first is that increasing amounts of submating generates local mate, local mate competition. So brothers are disproportionately likely to compete with other brothers for mating opportunities. And this discounts the fitness benefits of kind of male beneficial alleles to males. Secondly, when there's submating, females can also confer fitness effects upon their brothers. So say if there's a female beneficial allele, not only will it benefit the female that that allele resides within, but also if she mates with a brother, that brother will benefit uh, from the increased fitness of his mate. And finally, an effect that kind of only has, um, an effect that only falls upon our anatocus organisms is that increased inbredness also will promote feminization. So I won't go into any more detail here, but different types of inbreeding will have kind of slightly different effects. They'll definitely modulate the relatedness and competition amongst males and females. But broadly, we can see that generally under a wide range of different kinds of inbreeding systems, it'll often promote feminization, although to slightly different extents and slightly differently under our different genetic systems. And the final thing I want to focus on is how sexual antagonism might lead to conflicts uh, between different actors. 
and in particular I want to think about how it can lead to parent conflict and conflict between parents and their offspring. So we see kind of in lots of other traits that parents and offspring might disagree about the traits that their offspring should express. And also under kind of other traits as well, we see the potential disagreement between mothers and fathers because they place different valuations upon sons and daughters in their brood. And particularly this, a lot of this work has kind of been relevant to kind of sex allocation. But here I'm gonna think about this in respect to sexual antagonism. So kind of slightly different type of model this time, imagine we have kind of this Gaussian fitness function for males and females where we have a, fem a fitness optimum here for females and a fitness optimum to ma for males. If we assign control of this trait to either offspring, mothers or fathers, how does this trait evolve and where do we, where do we get to? So here if we have the female optimum at one and the male optimum at minus one. And here I've assigned control either to the offspring, to the mothers in orange or to the fathers in green. So what we can see is that if under diploidy, with kind of increasing amounts of submating, mothers, offspring and fathers are all increasingly feminized. Have we seen to different extents? Mothers and fathers are more feminized than their own. And this is very similar to an effect we see again in sex allocation that was first noted by Trivers, which is that parents often favor kind of more female by sex ratios than, than their offspring. And this is because under increasing amounts of submating, the brood is kind of, um, is more successful um, if there's kind of increased amounts of feminization, but nonetheless an individual would rather be fit to themselves even at some uh, cost to the rest of the brood. However, this pattern isn't identical under our different genetic systems. Here under male PG, we see that initially, um, we see that fathers uh, uh, favor very high levels of feminization when there's no submating because of course fathers don't contribute anything to their sons in the long run. Um, so would kind of rather a much more feminized trait value. Uh, mothers would rather a kind of equal trait value and then offspring as we saw above are kind of uh, more feminized. However, this changes with increasing amounts of submating as we see this interesting pattern where actually the extent of conflict changes direction. And finally, we see this pattern under Renatoki where just as with diploidy, both mothers and fathers favor increasing amounts of feminization in their offspring, but to different, ex different extents, with fathers, fathers face, uh, favoring increased amounts of feminization compared to either mothers or offspring. Okay, so yeah, in summary, we've kind of considered three broad kind of things that might affect sexual antagonism. Firstly, how different combinations of transmission and somatic genetics, in particular focusing on Aranatoki versus male PG. Secondly, how different mating ecologies will alter sexual antagonism. And finally, thinking about who controls the trait, again, altering the, the, um, uh, the fate of sexual antagonistic alleles. So yeah, uh, if we have any questions, I think I've kept to time okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Thomas. So Jan will be handling the questions. Um, make sure if you have questions, you, you send them to Jan, uh, sorry, Inbar. Uh, you send them to Inbar uh, on the uh, chat or on uh, Slack. We'll just wait a little bit longer. Um, Inbar, you're there, right? I am, yeah. I um, unfortunately I came in a little bit late, so normally I would have many questions for you, um, but I had some technical difficulties. But I'm very happy to pass on uh, anybody else's questions. Okay, well, Thomas, it doesn't seem like there's any questions right now, but... When has oh. come in. Yeah, Perfect. so Sam would like to know, how does the feminization interact with selection for dominance? I see. So, um, so do you mean in terms of... So the scenarios are kind of, if I go back a little bit. 
Do you mean in these scenarios how this relates to? Yeah, whether or not there's selection for dominance. Uh, you know, we, it because you showed an effect of of dominance versus recessiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, is that so? Will there actually be selection for dominance or recessiveness in these different scenarios? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I know there's been some models where you, yeah, you consider things like the evolution of reversals of dominance or, or something, but that's not something I've explicitly considered here. Here we've kind of treated dominance as though it's a, a parameter um, rather than something that necessarily evolves itself. But I suppose it's, yeah, it's, it's possible that dominance itself will evolve as a trait. And I'm not quite sure how that will necessarily play out uh, under these different systems that we've looked at. Does that semi-answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Well, as, no, as long as nobody has another question, I've got one, which yep. is these two different um, uh, forms, um, the male PGE versus a Renatoki, mm -hmm. uh, does one evolve from the other or do they evolve independently? And, uh, I, yeah. yeah, I think one, I think that's a kind of semi open question and there are better people than me placed, I think, to answer how the systems evolve. I think, I think it's unclear in certain cases where the one evolves from the other. Um, uh, I think the, the, op the, the assumption would be that our Anatoki evolves from male PG, but I don't necessarily think that there's, it's certain that that happens in every case or has, although that's always been the direction of travel. Yeah. And then do your models say anything about, uh, you know, about how these things are going to evolve, what, what the conditions are, would be that would favor one form of haplodiploidy over the other or, you know, when they're going to evolve? Yeah, so for this, we've we've treated these as though these are kind of, the systems themselves are fixed and they don't evolve themselves. It's almost like that's the kind of constant. And then we've looked at how sexual antagonism is expected to play out, um, kind of given those systems are fixed. But you're right, in reality, there's the potential that these will co-evolve with the systems as well. And maybe that's a, a kind of another question to pursue, but at the moment we've just treated these as though they are kind of, they're fixed. And I think at least for kind of short-term, um, kind of more recent evolution, maybe that's that's kind of a reasonable assumption, but you're right. These will co-evolve with things like sexual antagonism. And that's something that is worth exploring. Thank you. I don't see any more questions coming in right now. So if anybody has sure. has theirs and they want to get it in the last minute, uh, go ahead. And uh, while we're seeing if another one comes in, I'd like to remind everyone that you can, um, since there's sometimes a delay time in typing in your question, uh, you can send uh, Thomas uh, a question via the chat or uh, potentially the Slack, and he can answer that afterward. In addition, for those of you watching along, uh, you can sort of type a question into the chat, but not hit return until the talk is over. That way you can get your, your question ready and queued up um, so, so that you can get it in right after the speaker finishes. Yeah, and if okay, anyone uh, wants to hit me up, then just email me or hit me on my Twitter and I'll loiter around here for a while as well. Yep, yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Yeah, okay, Great. thanks. Okay, so in the minute that we have coming up, we'll switch over to Molly Albecker, who is going to talk to us about a novel analytical framework to study relationships among genetic and environmental influence on phenotypes. Go for it, Molly. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Great. All right, well, I'm happy to be here. I wanna thank the um, organizers for putting on such a wonderful conference so far. I've really had a nice time watching a lot of these talks. And I'm excited to talk to you about some of the work I've been doing as a part of my postdoc with the Research Coordinated Network for Evolution and Changing Seas with Katie Lauterhouse and Jeff Trussell. 
So geographic variation and clines in phenotype have long served as the observational basis for ecological and evolutionary investigations. And generally, at a very basic level, what we're interested in is understanding the genetic and environmental drivers of these clines. So we will use experimental designs like reciprocal transplants, where we go out to an environment we transplant individuals across populations into different environments and measure their phenotype, or we use uh, an experimental design called common garden where we take individuals out of nature, bring them to the lab and expose them to some shared gradient of conditions and measure phenotype. And then by fitting reaction norms to these phenotypes, we can get a good understanding of whether the environment alone is driving these clines in phenotype, whether genotype alone is driving clines in phenotype, or whether it's some interaction of genotype and environment. And I wanna take a moment to really focus on these genotype and environment interactions because these are particularly important. Uh, these interactions indicate that each genotype is responding differently to the same environment or that genetic variation in plasticity exists. And in our modern age where climate change, urbanization, all sorts of different environmental changes are really drastically changing the environments that organisms inhabit, understanding these G by E uh, uh, interactions can really help us understand how organisms are going to be impacted by environmental change. And what G by E ultimately means is that we cannot predict the phenotype with only one piece of information. We need both, we need information on genotype and environment in order to make an accurate prediction. But G by E or genotype by environment interactions are not the only way that these two features interact um, to uh, affect phenotype. We know that covariance can exist between genotype and environment. And formally, this means that genotypic effects on phenotype are non-randomly associated with environmental effects on phenotype. And a little bit more simply, it just means that genotype and environment are both affecting phenotype. So Levins was one of the first ones to document patterns of covariance in, uh, in Drosophila along an altitudinal gradient in Puerto Rico. And Bervins, Keith Bervins followed shortly thereafter following similar patterns in frogs. Um, and in the 80s, Conover found patterns of covariance in Atlantic silversides along a latitudinal gradient. And it was really Conover who popularized the ideas of covariance and really um, drove the ball down the field for, for a lot of this work. And I myself found patterns of covariance in the frogs that I studied during my dissertation. So we have known about covariance for over 50 years now, um, at least. We have abundant examples in nature across a variety of taxa. And it may be as important as G by E in understanding how organisms are evolving and what their responses to climate change will be. So why aren't we all measuring it? Well, probably the chief reason is because we don't have a way to measure it. Um, this is not for lack of trying. So in 1989, Falconer in his now classic book, Intro to Quantitative Genetics, suggested that in order to measure trait variation or VP, uh, phenotypic variation here, we must measure all these different other areas of trait variation. So variation due to environment, variation due to genotype, and variation due to G by E. And then any variation that's left over, we can call covariance. Um, unfortunately, his approach requires inbred lines and various other controls that are not always tractable in wild systems. So this has largely um, been unused in uh, research. So if there's no way to measure it, um, what were Levins, Bourbon, Conover, and myself calling covariance? Well, typically researchers would identify visual patterns in reaction norms across environments and genotypes. And if it conformed to certain expectations, they would call it covariance. And these patterns they were looking for, there were two different types. One is uh, positive covariance. 
So I'm showing here two reaction norms of G1 and G2. G1 is green, it's native to environment one in green. G2 is blue, it's native to environment two in blue. And so what I'm showing here is that um, positive covariance is also called co-gradient variation. And this just means the influence of genotype and environment are moving in the same direction on phenotype. So here I'm showing a positive slope indicating that um, environment has a positive effect on phenotype. And because G2 is above G1 and therefore has a greater effect on phenotype, it also has a positive effect on phenotype. And if we look at the phenotype of each genotype in its native environment, we do tend to see an exaggeration of phenotypic differences across environments. And this is in contrast to negative covariance, which is called countergradient variation, or what Levin's called contragradient variation. Um, and this is, occurs when um, we have the genotypic and environmental uh, influences on phenotype that oppose each other. So again, I'm showing the same plot. And again, we see a positive influence of environment on phenotype. But instead now genotype, genotype two has a smaller impact on phenotype than genotype one. So that is a, now opposing the influence of environment. And again, if we look at the native environments or if the phenotype of each genotype in their native environments, because they are opposing each other, it cancels out any phenotypic changes we might expect to see across environments. Um, and so people have been talking about this and publishing about this for a really long time. And there are real consequences of not having a way to quantify it. So first of all is visual detection has its limits. We know that when we rely on visual cues, we may be missing instances of covariance. If there are say larger designs or if G by E is occurring in the data, for example, in this pattern, is there covariance in these, in these reaction norms? Um, hard to say. Uh, and second of all, we cannot statistically test whether these patterns we're detecting are, are real. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, we cannot answer these bigger questions involving covariance. Covariance has implications for our understanding of evolution, how organisms will respond to climate change, and right now we don't even have any idea on how common it is in nature. So I, along with Katie Lauterhouse and Jeff Trussell, have spent the last couple of years um, addressing this problem. And in the process, we have built a method to measure covariance, estimate error, and perform hypothesis tests. So for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to give um, an idea for the intuition of the approach, the equation uh, specifics, how it can be used, and then also some uh, guidelines on how to design experiments that are best able to detect covariance. So if we're uh, thinking about the intuition behind the analysis, let's imagine the same two genotype, two environment design where you go out and you collect phenotypic data across an environmental climb. You fit a reaction norm to each genotype and you get these results. So the first question that we would ask to measure covariance is what are the genotypic effects on phenotype? So the genotypic effects are the average phenotype of each genotype across environments. So for genotype one, that would be approximately here. And on the right, I'm just showing a relative measurement of um, G1 and G2 relative to each other. And for G2, that would be approximately here. The next question would be to ask, what are the environmental effects on phenotype? So this is sort of the flip side of the genotypic effect. So this is what is the average phenotype of each environment across genotypes. So the average phenotype for environment one is approximately here. And the average environment for, um, excuse me, the average phenotype for environment two is approximately here. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is this plot on the right that shows now that we have matched each genotype to its native environmental average. And the covariance is the relationship between those points. So this equation, uh, allows us to measure that joint variability between genotypic and environmental effects on phenotype. And so in this equation, this term here, this Y bar I minus Y bar, this describes the genotypic effects. And this Y bar J minus Y bar, this describes the environmental effects on phenotype. 
I'd like to take a moment and discuss this I variable. So this is what we're calling the indicator variable. And we put this in because if you were to say, do a for loop in R and just chug these data through a for loop, it would give you every combination of genotype with both environments. And that's as indicated here, not what we're interested in. We're only interested in those measurements when they are correctly matched with their uh, proper native environment. And so this indicator variable um, allows us to make sure that only those that are correctly matched are counted towards the covariance estimation. So if it's incorrectly matched, it'll be multiplied by zero, which cancels it out for the, um, for the estimation. And this also brings up a really important point is that we need to know which genotypes are native to which environments in order for this analysis to be successful. Um, unfortunately, in the literature, um, oftentimes this information is absent, and so it makes measuring covariance a little bit difficult. Uh, we wanted to standardize our measure of covariance because this would allow us to compare estimates across species or across study systems. We tried correlation, which standardizes by the standard deviation of genotypic and environmental data, but that didn't preserve the effects of the relationship because covariance uh, is non-independent. So to account for this non-independence, we just standardized by the standard deviation of one or the other, depending on which one was bigger. We use bootstrapping to generate 95% confidence intervals around our sample estimates by sampling phenotype with replacement from each genotype and environment group. And then we use permutation for hypothesis testing in which we resample phenotype across genotype and environment uh, without replacement to generate a null distribution. And so in the end, this gives us a way to generate sample estimates for covariance, or as we call CoveGE, that range between negative one and one. And as a reminder, anything less than zero is counter gradient variation, and it gets stronger, uh, the pattern gets stronger the further from zero you go. And above zero is co gradient variation. Now, a major reason behind choosing this approach is because it allows us to measure covariance based on reaction norms produced from common garden and reciprocal transplant designs. Um, so we simulated data reflecting a variety of scenarios across these two experimental designs. And so here I'm showing just a classic uh, reciprocal transplant design with four genotypes and four environments, and then we could vary the amount of G by E seen in those uh, reaction norms. And then also I wanna change this example of the fruit fly with our common garden, just to show a paired common garden design in which you collect different genotypes that share the same environment. So you collect multiple cold environment populations and multiple warm environment populations. And then this would be, might be what their reaction norms look like. And when you apply our approach, what you see is each of these I have selected specifically because they are all very uh, good examples of strong co-gradient variation. So each of these is nearing one, positive one, and they are all statistically significant. Now, I cherry picked those three uh, just to give an idea of what the analysis would uh, do and what the simulations look like. But in reality, I actually simulated over 30,000 different combinations of experimental designs and effect sizes to really identify which designs best detect covariance in nature. So I'm going to show you two heat maps um, where on each tile, I'm going to show two numbers. One, the top number is the total sample size. So the number of genotypes, the number of environments, and the number of samples. And then the, the, um, the number below it is the statistical power, which we define as one minus the false negative rate. And so to show the results from the full reciprocal transplant, if we are trying to design our experiments so that we have 80% power to detect moderate, so not too strong, but you know moderate levels of covariance, what we need is 256 samples. And there's some wiggle room on whether or not those samples are collected with gene, um, whether you heavily sample genotype or uh, replication within uh, genotype. And for paired common garden, it's the same result where 256 samples are needed for adequate power. 
And I'd like to also draw your attention to what's going on at these two sample size or these two genotype scenarios, because these were really um, common in early studies that identified covariance. Because like I said before, when you rely on visual cues, you need a simple design to detect those visual cues. But what our analysis actually found is that unfortunately those designs are underpowered. And so really what we wanna know is does this approach work on empirical data? So I volunteered my data that I um, found patterns that are consistent with counter gradient variation. And Jeff, who is a co-author on this paper also- Four uh, minutes, Molly. Okay, thank Molly, you. Four minutes, okay. Got it, thank you. Um, Jeff also a uh, co-author on this work volunteered some of his data in which he also identified co-gradient variation in a population uh, of marine snails that uh, are adapted to different flow regimes. And so when we apply our metric, we do find that with uh, Hyla scenario, they are, um, they do show significant patterns of counter gradient variation. And uh, with Jeff's, we also see actually stronger patterns of co counter gradient variation. But I would like to draw attention to the fact that his was not significant. And this is likely an artifact of the, um, fact that he only used two genotypes. So it's less likely that the pattern itself is not real, but just the fact that it's underpowered to truly detect these differences. So hopefully I have convinced you that covariance is really important and we need to be studying it more, but research has been hampered for good reason. We didn't have a way to measure it. Uh, we have now built a quantitative method to measure it in nature using um, data that is available from G or, excuse me, um, reciprocal transplant and common garden designs. And we are really hoping that now that we have the tools, we can really um, investigate this further across a variety of taxa and systems. And so I'd really like to acknowledge my lab mates who helped out so much, the Research Coordinated Network for Evolution Changing Seas, NSF for funding that uh, RCN, and Northeastern for hosting me as a postdoc. And then please do contact me for any um, inquiries on code um, to implement this metric. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much, Molly. Um, there's a question from Andrew Hendry. Does the method ignore variance within the populations or samples? And does that matter? It, Are you talking about replicate, like the common garden design where you have replicate samples? No, I mean, it, it takes, it, it's looking at only the, it's fantastic by the way, um, I can't, can't wait to use it, um, but it, it looks only at the means, right? Yes. And I'm just wondering if, if the, the precision of the estimates of the individual means mean anything from an evolutionary or statistical perspective, because if they do, they're not considered as a part of this approach. Yeah, um, we did not look at that explicitly. I can say that if you if you are interested in that variation, the more samples you collect, the better precision you have in the estimate itself, which you know. Um, but we did not look to see whether the variance itself affects the estimate, because as you said, we're just looking at the means. Yeah. Um, and then. Also, how does canalization affect the estimates? Canalization. Um, that's a good question. That would, that should affect, well, it'll affect everything. Um, that's essentially a similar question, I believe, because that should be reduced variation. Yeah, so I guess I would just repeat the same, the same thing is we did not look explicitly at variation. That might be something I'll talk to Katie and Jeff about um, after this, but uh, we would assume that less variation would lead to a more accurate estimation of the mean. Um, did I say that right? More accurate estimation of the mean. Um, but I'm not sure evolutionarily how that would affect things. 
Okay, Molly, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, we need to move on to the next talk. Uh, the thank next you. talk is a pre recorded talk uh, by Juliano Morimoto that Mike Whitlock will play for us. Um, there won't be time for questions at the end of this one because the pre recorded talk takes almost an entire time frame. But uh, hopefully, Juliano can respond um, well on the chat, but also particularly on the Slack channel. Okay, so let's go ahead and play the. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Giuliano Marmoto. Thank you for coming. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about applying the theory of justice to academia. Can we build just in fair academic community? And this is a conceptual model uh, that I want to present to you today. Please ask the tough questions. If not at the end, you can send me an email. I think I want to encourage this to be a collaborative effort moving forward. So before we start, just some clarification of scope. This is a sensitive topic. And as such, I would like you to dissociate my delivery from the idea. Of course, I put a lot of effort to, into you know, creating this topic, but I might not have delivered in the way that you please, that, that pleases you. So please dissociate the delivery from the idea itself and let's discuss the idea moving forward. I have no intentions to advocate benefits to a particular group, as we shall see later in the end. And instead, what I want to do is to stimulate ideas and generate debate and strive in the future for true equality of opportunity to all. And if in the end, everything I present here with this regard after, discuss after discussion, I'm fine with it. This is science, right? Uh, so let's get into it. The basic takeaway message of this talk is that we should incorporate individuals as ecological contest during the academic selection processes. And this is valid for allocation of grants, fellowships, and, and you know, other distributive income that we say um, in, in academic communities. And in doing so, we will generate true equality of opportunities to all. And I hope to convince you uh, by the end of the talk today. So if you're, we all know that the ac academia is unjust is, and it has inequalities. If you don't believe in that, then you know it's not going to be one or two slides that will convince you so i will assume that everyone here understands that academia it's not a fair and, and a fair community and it doesn't promote true equality of opportunities to all there are several papers about it so this is the assumption that i'm i'm, I'm going forward with and i ask a question can academia and academic institution strive for true equality opportunities and if so how so there are two ways, basically, that widespread that we attempted, in a sense, to generate a true equality of opportunities. The first one is the discretization of career path. Okay, and this is a standard across the world. You have you finish your PhD, you have years post PhD where you are eligible for fellowships. Let's say, okay, this is just an example of a fellowship in the UK where I am based uh, right now. These landmarks change, but they're all relative to the year post PhD. The problem with that is that PhDs vary widely across countries, right? Just an example, PhD in the US takes roughly almost twice as, as long as the PhD in the UK. And therefore, these differences in, in how PhD works in each country differentiate the opportunities that each individual have in each of these particular countries and in the system as a whole. So it's difficult to create this fixed landmark of post-PhD because it, in a sense, it doesn't take into account the variation between countries. The second and perhaps most innovative and it hasn't been implemented everywhere, but it's, it's truly innovative, is the lottery system in New Zealand where you have a pool of applicants, you have an initial screen and you have the lottery award. And the lottery is supposed to be a stochastic event and therefore uh, it is supposed to introduce fairness in the system. Now, the problem with that is that if the pool of applicants is skewed, then a fair lottery system will still reproduce the skewed distribution of the pool of applicants unless the initial screen somehow mitigate that effect, right? I particularly don't know. I couldn't find this information whether the initial screening, uh, you know, mitigate any skewness. But the point here is that unfairness can emerge even from a fair process. What I want to convince you or at least present you the idea here in this talk is a third option where we could implement concepts of the theory of justice uh, to generate true equality of opportunity to all. Let's dive into it a little bit more. 
So the theory of justice is based on the theory of justice, the book uh, by John Rawls, which who was a philosopher, an American philosopher, and he wrote a book called The Theory of Justice, where he equates justice as fairness. And amongst all these things, all, all the things that he wrote, three main concepts are important, and they are concepts of the original position, the veil of ignorance, and the decisions made in the original positions under the veil of ignorance, right? So basically put, original position would be, imagine that we have souls before you get to the body in, your plan, in the planet, right? So the souls are all equal. They are aware that there are there exist inequalities in the planet, but they don't know where they will be in the spectrum of inequalities, right? So this is the veil of ignorance. So they are ignorant to where they're going to lie. And basically these souls, they have to come up in, in, with rules that dictate how the society will work. And what John Rawl proposed is that individuals in this original position under the veil of ignorance will make decisions and you know deciding how society is going to work in a just manner simply because they don't know where they're going to end up with so they, there is no favoritism in that respect and that's the veil of ignorance and this idea that justice is blind to inequalities is the whole purpose why we represent justice icons with a blindfold, right? So this is, for example, uh, in Greek mythology, we have uh, a representation of justice that is blindfolded. The problem is that in reality, the original position is unattainable and the veil of ignorance in, in fact doesn't exist. So in a sense, we know that justice is not blindfolded. Justice is not blind. Then how can we mitigate that? How can we overcome the fact that we cannot be in a position where we don't know where we're going to end up in the society and therefore make just decisions? One way that I think we should move, should progress moving forward is that we need to identify the sources of inequality. And here, perhaps an example would, you know, will illustrate a point better. Here, I took the percentage of 25 to 34 year old with tertiary education by level. Uh, and this was extracted from the Education at Glance, published in 2020. And I picked two countries that represent two opposites, basically. It's Slovenia and Brazil, which is the country that I come from. So in Slovenia, 37% of this cohort have tertiary education, 7% of which at the PhD level. In Brazil, on the other hand, 21% have tertiary education only, and less than 1% at the PhD level. Now, that means in itself that PhD amongst this cohort is more than seven times higher in Slovenia compared to Brazil. And this in itself translates into a whole other ecological spectrum of things that favor individuals to get a PhD in Slovenia. And bear in mind, I'm just using Slovenia as a, an example, right? I'm not, I have nothing against Slovenia or nothing in favor of Brazil. Uh, it's just in, for, for the purpose of illustration. Now, if you go to, for instance, in Slovenia, social attitudes towards further education might be different than those in Brazil. Social expectations, opportunities to get a PhD degree, and so on and so forth might be different. So for the sake of this example, would it be fair to assume that candidates obtaining a PhD in Slovenia or in Brazil have undergone the same challenges? Now, I know the PhD is supposed to have a standard, but we know, as we talked before, that during the PhD itself, they are very the varying structure, and therefore, there might be have each candidate might have different uh, opportunities during that PhD. So, is it fair to assume that they have undergone the same challenges? Now, you might be thinking, okay, this is just a cherry picked example. Let's look within Finland. Okay, Finland is even a better country in that education at glance uh, graph. It, it has a higher percentage of, of that cohort with tertiary education higher than the EU average, in fact. So let's look at this, and I will extract from a paper published by Helian and collaborators in 2019, which is a longitudinal study um, with a cohort from 64 and 66, and they assess whether parental level of academic education affected the, the chances of, of this cohort to progress in their academic achievements. And I extracted from the paper itself, because I think it illustrates perfectly the point here, is that Finnish professors born in this cohort, uh, amongst those that have parents that lack post-secondary education, 
about one in, ten, one, in, one in 110 became professors, while the same number was one in 140 among master's degree holders with at least one university educated parent. This means that there is a difference in, of 2.75 times the likelihood of the, the chances of the odds in a sense in this case of you attaining professorship if one of your parents had a university educated in Finland, which is a developed country in that respect. The authors interestingly went further into their assessment and they claim that, for instance, individuals of non-academic backgrounds who nevertheless became professors were more likely than others to have been advantaged in other ways. So in a sense, the academic, uh, in this case, Finnish academia community is even more socially selected in, than the results may suggest. Thus, there is no reason why academia everywhere is supposed to be this way, right? Socially selected. And therefore, academia as a whole is an environment that lacks true equality of opportunities. And why is that? Why do we lack true equality of opportunities? Why is academia socially selected? And here, I want to explain to you the concept of in exclusive and inclusive opportunities. And if you have this terminology I use, I created for the purpose of this talk, please feel free to make suggestions on how I can change it before we, we publish this. So let's go into exclusive opportunities. So exclusive opportunities, let's say you have a distribution of a trait, it has its mean in the population. We select the outstanding based on how far they are from the mean. And we claim that those are the best based on merit, right? An example of this is the Olympic games. We don't care who is the tallest or heaviest. All we care about is who runs the fastest, who jumps the highest and so on. So this, in this exclusive opportunity context, outstanding is relative to the population distribution, but it ignores diversity and focus on the utilitarian outcome, let's say strength in the Olympic games. Uh, a unit of effort is equal for each individual, you know, to increase from in this distribution, uh, but imposes, this exclusive opportunity imposes a lot more effort to the least advantage so they can make the cut to the outstanding. So basically, if you are on the opposite side of the curve from the outstanding, you have to put a lot more effort to get there. And if you don't, the assumption is that you did you fail because you lack merit. Now, the inclusive opportunity does not, it still has the population distribution, but assumes that within that distribution, you have types, okay? And each of those types have their own mean. And then you apply this outstanding, not to the population as a whole, but for each type within the population. This could be, for instance, socioeconomic background or the parents or parent level education, as we saw in, fin in Finland. And by doing so, we select the best and the outstanding relative to the opportunities available to those types. Okay. In this case, outstanding is relative to the type of opportunities available for that particular cohort promotes diversity, and a unit of effort is equal across individuals, but does not impose a, a hugely more costly effort to the least advantage with, in this whole population, as, in the population as a whole, okay? So in a sense, inclusive opportunities is, is what we want to generate diversity. Now, what do we need to go to inclusive opportunities? The difference between exclusive and inclusive opportunities is the collection of data, data that makes us understand the sources of inequality. So it is impossible, no matter how much we claim, in my, at least in my opinion, for academia and academic institutions to adopt these inclusive opportunities if they don't have the information about the sources of the inequality. And here, for example, imagine that in the exclusive opportunity scenario, we have a blind approach. You have an application, you have two CVs, you don't know where they come from. You have no information apart from what is written in that particular application. This assumes that both candidates had the same opportunities and differences are based solely on merit. Now for an inclusive opportunity, it's a data-driven approach where you have the CVs, but you also have the ecological context from where those CVs were generated. And this not only provides more context to the CV itself, but acknowledges that opportunities and differences in those CVs may not have been solely based on merit. Now, how can we do that in reality? And this is where I think the recent advances in technology can allow us, you know, to, to push this forward. And this is particularly true for big data and machine learning. So basically what we could, and this is a conceptual model, couldn't test it because of COVID, uh, 
is to generate a database of global ecological information. Let's say we take percentage of PhDs, tertiary education, as I showed at, in the education at glance, inequality scores, and so on. And we apply to a model, in this case, a machine learning algorithm, that will standardize and provide a standard of each of these candidates based on the, this database of ecological information, uh, a score for each of those relative to what is expected from the population where these CVs or those candidates come from. Once we do that, then we have a true quality of opportunities of the comparison between the two CVs. Together with peer review, which I don't think you will and you know go away anytime soon, and I don't necessarily think it should go away, but we know it's bias. If we combine a fair ecological score with a peer review score on the merits of the project itself, then we have a final marking, which is, if it's not fair, at least it's fairer than it, what it is today. Now, I have an asterisk there in machine learning. I know the machine learning algorithms today, they are not fair. They are unfair. We have biases, but I am assuming, and perhaps I'm too optimistic, that in the future, we can overcome those biases. Whereas the unconscious bias, for instance, in human behavior, we, I don't think we can to the, you know, no matter how best, how, how good is our effort. So I know the caveat here, the machine learners are biased. I just want to make the point that I believe this can be mitigated in the future. Now, what are the, some of the potential immediate criticism of this? And one of these is that, okay, so will selection processes become too personalized? Basically, in other words, where do we draw the line? How much data we need to collect, right? And for this, I suggest us to take the pragmatic approach. Let's consider factors known through scientific knowledge to affect academic achievement and potential. For instance, we had the example in Finland. In Finland um, parental education is a factor that affects potential for career achievement. So this should be a variable that we, we could collect from and, and to make things fairer. And of course, we need to research more, right? Uh, um, about what socioeconomic and other ecological factors that can affect academic achievement. So we truly understand all the surroundings, the ecological context of, of a selection process. Now, there are a lot more of ecological factors that influence a, uh, academic achievement. And for that, I suggest the, the literatures of uh, Yuri Braun from Brenner and more recently, Jay Belsky and collaborators on, on the ecology of human development and, you know, this, this broader field of, of ecological uh, effects on human potential. Now, I don't have time to dive into each specifics here, but I, I believe that the example in Finland um, illustrate that very well. Now, just to reiterate, this talk, the purpose of this talk was to convince you that we should incorporate individuals' ecological context during the academic selection processes thereby generating true equality of opportunities to all. Now, what can we do? This might seem far-fetched, you know, all the models that are presented here. Uh, what can we do then in the immediate, like right now, uh, to, to, to change and generate uh, true equality of opportunities? First one is to create a pilot model and test what I just presented to you. And we are in the process of doing this. But, you know, more, more immediate, we can be empathetic and be kind, and we can acknowledge that others, particularly from developing regions, may not have had the same opportunities that we had in, in other countries. Acknowledge that we cannot, even with the best of our intentions, objectively assess someone's potential from socioeconomic backgrounds and cultures that are very different than ours. And therefore, we should seek true diversity of inputs from different socioeconomic backgrounds, cultures, countries, and so on. One thing that we are trying to do here at the University of Aberdeen is to incorporate an ecological statement where the candidate and the supervisors explain the circumstances around the candidature. So providing an ecological context for why that candidate is suitable for the, the position that they are applying for, not only relying on the CV. And with that, I would like to thank you. I know it was run, but it was quick, but I had you know a limited time. Thank you very much again ask the hard questions, uh, play the devil's advocate. Uh, I think this is a collaborative effort that we're all responsible for. True equality of opportunity is the responsibility of all of us. Uh, and please get in touch and stay safe. And I see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much, uh, Juliano. Um, we don't have time for questions. Uh, we have to move on right to the next speaker. But remember, you can send questions to Juliano on the Slack channel. But also, he provided his email in that last uh, slide, which you can revisit uh, on the YouTube feed if you need to. OK, so uh, next, we're going to go to uh, Rafael Mura, who's going to talk to us about assortative mating in space and time, patterns and biases. Raphael, you're muted. Can you hear me? Now we can. Oh, nice. Uh, let me try again. Yeah, you need to share again your... Can you see the presentation? It's good. Oh, nice. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, uh, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Rafael, and I will present a lecture, Assortative Mating in Space and Time, Partners and Biases. So, Assortative Mating can be described as a deviation from random mating that can emerge from a tendency in mating preference for phenotypically similar or similar partners. Partners. So we can measure assortative mating using a correlation uh, of uh, mating pairs, of, of a given trait of mating pairs. When this correlation is positive, we call it as uh, positive assortative mating. When it's negative, we call it uh, negative assortative mating. It's very important to identify partners of assortative mating in nature because they can provide uh, uh, precious information about how selection is affecting, affecting that given trait. For example, if the assortative mating is positive, uh, maybe this trait is under intuitive selection, in which the extreme phenotypes are favored by selection. So, um, sympathetic speciation is likely to occur. However, when the negative assortative mating uh, occurs, uh, stabilizing selection may favor the average type. So, no speciation is expected. Associative mating can be classified also uh, depending on the trait under selection. For example, uh, Young et al. classified uh, the types of associative mating as age, behavior, chemical conditions, ecotype, genotype, phenology, size, structure, and visual. However, they separate what we call as size associative mating literature in two different types. They call size as, the, as measures of the whole body size, for example, body length, and structure as a measure of a body part, for example, the carapace width of a spider or some insect. However, here, I will refer to size associative mating as any type of measure of a body size, because they are frequently correlated, and in the literature, you, you will readily see some kind of structural associative mating. So researchers use to practice to investigate associative mating in nature, but they may have some problems that I will discuss here. The first one is if you want to study associative mating in two populations or two different, different breeding periods, you may measure the size of uh, individuals in copula, and you can find two correlations, for example, two kinds of negative associative mating. However, if you observe the populations, you will see that the average size of individuals is different. So when you pull this data, what happens is a positive bias in the estimate of assortative mating. We can call this uh, Simpson's paradox, or in the literature of assortative mating, uh, scale of choice effect. Here in our database, we found almost 46% of the studies perform this kind of practice. Uh, a second practice, is to draw broad conclusions for the whole population or even the whole species based on a single measure of associative mating. This can be very problematic, especially if associative mating varies in space and time. So in this example, you can see that there is a positive associative mating, but in another moment or in another population, another population, you can obtain a different pattern. 
we found uh, almost 38% of the studies in this database performed this kind of practice and from broad conclusions using single measures. So our goal was real here, sorry, was to use uh, uh, correlations between uh, mating pairs um, to form a systematic review and a meta-analysis to evaluate the positive bias of spatially and temporally data on the size sorted mating patterns, how consistent patterns of size sorted mating are across space and time, and general patterns of assorted mating across and within the touch of animals uh, when the bullet defect size are excluded. So we follow the PRISMA protocol. I will not describe the details, but I will present here. Uh, basically, we chose two keywords, which is size assortative and size associative, and those three database. So we obtained initially uh, more than 50,000 results. And our last survey was formed in 20 April 2018. Uh, in total, we obtained uh, the largest data set about the size of teeth mating published to the date. So uh, 1,827 effect size from 457 studies using 321 species. So we identified a, a pattern uh, throughout the decades in which the gray bile represent new studies published in each decade, decade and the black dots and this, the lines represent the cumulative number of Publications. So, as you can see, uh, sorted mating is a ongoing uh, uh, a field of study which is growing in each decade. When we distinguish the types of pooling practice that we classify as spatial pooling, temporal pooling, or no pooling, and even both pooling practice, we saw a tendency here that most studies publish um, partners without using any kind of pooling practice. However, the number of studies using temporal pooling practice has increased. So basically, we screen each study uh, looking for uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient, R. And when data was presented in graphs, we extracted the data, uh, the data, the data points uh, using the, the web plot JITSA software and calculated our one correlation coefficient or transform all the statistics into the R correlation coefficient using the MetaWin calculator. So we use all these uh, this measures of correlation coefficient to, um, to transform in Fisher Z, which we used as effect size in our study. Uh, Fisher Z, we use this kind of statistics because Fisher Z presents normal distribution of residuals. So we also added the weight for each effect size, which was the inverse of variance uh, that is, was calculated using the number of samples. So for each, we, we formed a several multi-level meta-analysis using the metaphor package and included as random variables, the effect size ID, the study ID, the species ID, and the phylogenetic relationships. We also added as moderator in the analysis the uh, pooling practice, yes and no, if there is any kind of pooling practice or no. And what we also distinguish the effects of different kinds of pooling practice, spatial, temporal, the interaction, and compared to no pooling practice. We measure heterogeneity using sigma square and i square, which measure the percentage of the total variance attributed to the random variables. So we calculated the obtaining the phylogenetic relationships using the open tree of life data set. Uh, we extracted the metazoa tree and uh, pruned the tree to obtain uh, phylogenetic relationships uh, for the species included in the meta -analysis. We also classified the animals in different subphyla. Uh, here you can see a funnel plot with all the results separated by the types of uh, pooling practice. And we identified a, a positive publication bias. But we investigated different sources of the bias, um, such as the dimensionality of the trait, which could be multi tree, B, unidimensional, or even dimensionless, the type of study, 
if the study was performed at the laboratory or at the field, and the year publication. However, none of these uh, moderators explained this uh, positive bias. So we assume that this may represent a true asymmetry in associative mating observed in nature. Uh, when we investigated the effect of pooling practice, we found a slightly positive uh, bias in studies that perform pooling practice compared to no pooling practice. And these results remain consistent after separating the types of pooling practice as spatial and temporal presented higher average effect size compared to no pooling practice. And there was no interaction. So there is a positive bias in uh, pooling data. Uh, when we compare the heterogeneity of all studies included in our meta-analytic models, we found a moderate heterogeneity. However, when we excluded uh, the studies that perform any kind of pooling practice, we found a significantly less, significantly less lower uh, heterogeneity. However, the impact of these new data set uh, on the average effect size was low. So in general, we found a moderately positive uh, average associative mating across all studies. Um, we also identified using this unbiased data set, a partner of, uh, of average effect size for each subfield. Uh, so mammalia was the only one that exhibited random matings while other, the others, the associative mating was positive and the uh, chinopitalic exhibited the highest value. The heterogeneity of this model was the lowest of all models that we presented here. So our average partner patterns reported in this meta-analysis are very consistent across studies. Uh, to test spatial and temporal consistency, we formed the same type of analysis using two different kinds of data set that presented spatial and temporal replicates. So we extracted the residuals of this meta-analysis to obtain an unbiased uh, response variable that we included in the repeatability test. So we use as random variable the spatial temporal replicates and to obtain the repeatability measure for each kind of, pooling, uh, of uh, replicate. So here we have the results, April's populations, the average part uh, uh, exhibit a low repeatability. Uh, Exapoda and Castropoda also exhibit repeatability, but most tasha, such as mammalia, amphibia, and crustacea, did not, did not exhibit any repeatability between uh, April's populations. And between breeding period, we found similar results because the average pattern will also exhibit a low repeatability. And Avis and Exapoda. Uh, presented similar results, but amphibia calicerata and crustacea did not exhibit um, perpetual patterns. In conclusion, associative mating can vary in space and time. So uh, associative mating estimations should be carefully analyzed before drawing conclusions about their potential mechanisms. Uh, focal samples, indeed provide important information about mating relationship, but they must be interpreted as punctual evaluation. So in attempt to extend these conclusions for different populations and breeds period can be misleading. Spatial temporal variation in associative mating is more common than previously thought, and ecological conditions may have important roles in drive sex variation. So if in, in the same species we can find a variation throughout time or space, we should look for some ecological conditions that can affect such consistency or variation. This is especially important because there is a need for a new hypothesis about the underlying mechanism of spatial temporal variation in associative mating patterns. Uh, to the date, we only have hypotheses that predict the occurrence or not of associative mating, but no, hypo no hypothesis is available to explain how associative mates should vary between uh, populations or uh, breeding periods. So I want to uh, thank you, my collaborators, uh, 
without whom this study would not be possible and all funding agents. So thank you very much. And I'm available for questions. Thank you. Great, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a question. Um, so, uh, Raphael, that, that's really exciting. And it, it, it sent me uh, immediately searching off free ecology letters where it's not quite out yet. So I'm, I'm anxiously waiting for its, for its emergence. Um, the question I had was that um, David Green rec recently analyzed this pooling problem using an urine assorted mating database in American Naturalist and found that there was actually a rather large effect of this uh, grouping, this pooling problem. And whereas I see from your analysis, it seems that it's much smaller. So what, what, what's your take on that? Are anurin special in this regard or is the analysis different or something? Our analysis is similar, but I also cited the work of Green's paper and, but he used a data set for amphibian. And here we are using a much larger database. So as, you can see in these results here, sorry. Let me come back a little bit. For repeatability patterns, you can see a high variation between subfield. So if you look for amphibia here, there is no repeatability uh, across populations and breed between breeding periods. So I would expect that pooling data would be more problematic for this particular subfield compared to, for example, hexapoda that accept a uh, higher uh, repeatability in cross populations in between breeding pairs. So the work of Green is really nice and inspiring. It helped me a lot, but uh, the, his data set is limited to amphibia. Um, while we wait for more questions, and I have one too, um, were you surprised to see, you know, basically a sort of mating be very common across all your tax, I think you said, except for mammals. Um, and if so, you know, what, what do you think that says about the sampling bias in studies? I don't know if I understood the question. You, you are trying to, to look for some explanation for why mammalia has a random pattern. Yeah, why is mammalia so different from the other taxa and did you find that surprising? What do you think that says about sort of the, the sampling bias? I think we can, we can look for many explanations here, but I think the difference of my data set compared to others is that I included humans here. So Young and, and collaborators and also another meta-analysis published in 2019 by Janik and collaborators excluded Homo sapiens from the analysis. So I think one of the, the reasons is because I included as a species here, our species here. But other uh, important questions is how um, mammals interpreted the significance of size in mate choice. For insects, for example, size had uh, several implications for how they, they uh, compete, they uh, choose mates, but this is necess not necessarily true for mammalian. There's other conditions that can be more important than size into mammals. So I think that could be one explanation, but my, the focus of my study was not to explore this asymmetry between uh, subfield, but just to report some unbiased estimation for each touch. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's it's a. I was surprised by that, and then I was thinking whether I should be surprised. So, um, but you're saying that a large, of, large part of that is because you included humans as mammals, yes. or at least some part of it. Yeah, which is also interesting that one, one taxon can have that effect. Um, I think we have one more minute for questions. Yes, I'm really curious to explore. Why, for example, uh, some subphila exceed higher values of associative mating while others do, do not? For example, Janik also had a, a paper in which he, he showed that um, the strength of associative mating does not explain the number of species that evolved 
that appear in each each subfilum, where I think his approach has some have, could have some improvements if we look for some variability in size associative mate, which was not his goal. So I think we can discover uh, um, a lot of new things here if we look as force. We look to associative mate not not as a static pattern, but something that can vary. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Raphael. Um, and we should move on to the next speaker. Uh, so you. next, we're going to hear from uh, Kyle Koblenz, who will talk to us about ecological boundaries, determine evolutionary trajectories on adaptive landscapes. Go for it, Kyle. All right, um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to talk hey, to you all. Hey, can we call the camera? <clears throat> I'm really excited to talk to you all today about um, some work that we've been doing, uh, looking at ecological boundaries and how they might constrain um, evolutionary trajectories of populations. <clears throat> so extinction is a powerful evolutionary force. And perhaps one uh, pretty spectacular example of this has been the effects of mass extinction. Um, so for mass extinctions over Earth's history have radically altered uh, and sh shaped and reshaped uh, the diversity of life on Earth over time. And perhaps one of the uh, most well-known examples of this is the um, extinction of uh, non-avian dinosaurs at the end Cretaceous, uh, which might be uh, partially the reason we're all here as it's thought that um, mammals have this large adaptive radiation following that extinction. Um, but ecologists and evolutionary biologists have also identified the importance of evolution on much smaller scales also. So for example, in <clears throat> evolutionary biology, there's this idea of Darwinian extinction, um, also known as evolutionary suicide. And uh, this is the idea that natural selection itself uh, can actually cause species to evolve to their own extinctions. And so we walk through an example here uh, using the example of a um, predator-prey interaction. We have a graph here where we have uh, predator fitness on the z-axis, and then this plane with the predator mean attack rate and predator population size. And so we can start, say, with our predator at the attack rate here, and there's selective pressure uh, for the predator to increase its mean attack rate. However, as the predator does that, um, this fitness surface drops. So uh, <clears throat> we see an increase in the mean attack rate of the predator, um, but we also see that in doing so, the predator actually evolves to a smaller population size. And this is because it's a more efficient predator, so it decreases the prey density, which decreases the predator's density itself. And we can let this continue to play out. And what we eventually see is that the predator's mean attack rate evolves to a point in which the predator population actually goes extinct. Um, and this suggests that um, there must be some sorts of constraints acting that um, keep uh, these populations from evolving to go extinct, or that uh, we just don't see these um, in nature because all of the species that have undergone this process don't exist anymore. Now, ecologists have also um, come up with this a similar idea about how um, traits and species might be constrained. And uh, this is a, an idea of stability selection. And stability selection says that well, the, the way communities are and the way we see them in the world is because they've undergone a process where unstable configurations of species have just gone extinct. And so what, what our end result is, is that we see uh, mostly these stable configurations of species. And so an example of this uh, comes from an idea of uh, a persistence domain that was introduced by um, Otto et al. in 2007. And so what they did was uh, to look at some models of tritrophic interactions and look at body sizes in allometric models. Um, so the parameters in these models were based on uh, body mass ratios of basal to intermediate species and the uh, intermediate species in the, to the top predator. And so we can look at this plane and they found this red area in which uh, they, Call the persistence domain in which all of the species in these tritrophic uh, food chains were able, were able to persist. And so uh, what they did was they also took um, data from actual empirical food webs 
and the associated body sizes. And they plotted these onto this graph as these black dots. And lo and behold, the vast majority of these data points landed in this persistence domain. And so this suggests ecologically that there also that extinction might also uh, create these constraints on traits that species are able to um, exhibit. And so we were thinking about this idea in terms of, well, if, if there are these sorts of constraints, how might this play out um, with contemporary eco-evolutionary dynamics? And so to think about this, um, we went directly to um, this classic evolutionary metaphor of the adaptive landscape. And so here we have um, a landscape where we imagine a population with two traits um, and there's some uh, fitness measure and we can say start our population at this white point. Well, traditional evolutionary theory tells us that that population should evolve towards higher fitness and that should follow the um, steepest selection grade. And so with this idea, we would expect that um, our population is just gonna evolve uh, right towards that higher fitness. However, if we think about this same situation, but say that there are these ecological boundaries that are likely to lead to extinction, we might get a very different picture. Where, for example, if this population were to evolve directly along the um, steepest selection gradient, they would all just go extinct. And so this suggests that um, there might be some other processes might be really important in determining how species are able to actually reach areas of high fitness. And that without um, thinking about these extinction boundaries, uh, we might, species might end up taking very different trajectories than what we might expect. And so this seems uh, like an interesting idea, at least hypothetically, um, it seems to make intuitive sense. Um, but we uh, wanted to see whether we could just do have a proof of concept model of whether this we might actually see this. And so what we did was uh, look at a classic predator prey model, uh, specifically the Rosenzweig MacArthur uh, predator prey model. And so let's walk through this real quick. Um, so R here is our resource uh, and its growth is logistic growth. And you might look at this equation and say that doesn't look like logistic growth. Um, <clears throat> but what we've done is we've just made births and deaths explicit. Uh, so B being births, D being deaths, and these Q terms are the interest specific density dependence. Uh, and this does have the exact same dynamics as the sort of traditional logistic uh, growth equation. All right, so our prey also suffer mortality from being eaten by C, our consumer. Uh, and in the Rosenzweig MacArthur model, uh, this happens, um, is described by a type two functional response. So A is the uh, predator's attack rate, H is the handling time, and so we also have a, uh, an equation for our consumer, um, same type two functional response describing the predator's feeding rate uh, with the attack rates and handling times. Now we have this conversion efficiency turning prey into predators. Um, and we have some density independent mortality rate. And we chose this predator prey model for specific reasons, well, a couple of them. Uh, and one is that there are these well-known boundaries that do exist. Uh, for this predator prey model. Uh, and they depend on the predator's handling times and attack rates. So this first boundary here is a, is, um, a feasibility boundary. And what that means is that if uh, the predator's attack rate and handling time fall below this, uh, then it can't eat enough to sustain a population. And so below this line, the consumer will go extinct. Now there's also another boundary, this upper boundary, which is a stability boundary. And so for any attack rate handling time combinations that fall above this line, the system will exhibit predator prey cycles. And uh, although the populations might be able to persist when they're cycling, they're also likely to run into these areas with either really low consumer or really low resource abundances uh, where the populations are likely to be very susceptible um, to extinction. And lastly, another reason to choose this is we know where the highest predator fitness is. And that's when the predator has low handling times and high attack rates. Um, so that's when they'll be eating the most and having the highest fitness. 
All right, so how did we actually model evolution? I won't go into a lot of detail about this, um, but the way in which we did it was to use uh, these Gillespie eco-evolutionary models, uh, which <clears throat> piggyback on uh, the, this Gillespie algorithm, which is a way to simulate ordinary differential equations in a stochastic manner. Uh, and so piggybacking off of that, um, what happens in these models is that we can take the parameters in these ordinary differential equations and model them as heritable traits uh, of individuals. And in doing so, um, this method uh, for modeling evolution in incorporates um, things like demographic stochasticity, drift, um, and trait variation and allows for extinction, which some other methods of uh, modeling evolution don't really allow uh, for these, uh, these eco-evolutionary feedbacks to happen as well. Um, and the stochastic component is really important here. As I mentioned earlier with the sort of cartoon where if species were to directly follow um, the strongest selection gradient, we know they're just going to evolve themselves into extinction. All right, so I'm gonna go over a couple of results that we got from doing this. Um, the first one is to look at those uh, stability and feasibility boundaries and just see what happens with persistence of populations when there's no evolution. So this will give us a sort of background of whether these boundaries actually describe well, um, <clears throat> whether populations are likely to persist or not. And then I'll just show an example of predator evolution occurring along these ecological boundaries uh, and what, how that influences the evolution, evolutionary trajectories. Um, so again, we have our handling times and attack rates and we have these deterministic boundaries. But what does it look like if we actually have um, populations within these boundaries? And so uh, for a bunch of different parameter values, I uh, simulated 100 populations of each of them uh, with no evolution and just asked how many of those persisted given that demographic stochasticity is happening. And what we see is that um, partially these boundaries are pretty well filled in, um, but at low handling times and high attack rates, the predator is actually so efficient um, at eating prey that the densities are so low um, that they're still likely to go extinct even within these boundaries. Um, we can look at different uh, Ks or carrying capacities, and we see that this uh, remains true across these. Although maybe we're starting to fill in um, a little bit here uh, at those low handling times. And it seems like there are at least some uh, unstable cycling populations that are persistent. All right, so let's add in the evolutionary component. So we have this background of where species are able to persist uh, in this handling time attack rate plane. And we'll just pick a starting value to start our predator population. at. And so if we do this, we can track over time uh, whether these uh, populations go extinct or whether they remain extinct. So if we look at this, uh, we see that um, predicted decently well by this persistence, uh, we see that populations that evolve uh, these higher attack rates end up going extinct, whereas our persistent populations remain at, this, uh, at these lower attack rates. And so we can look at this another way by looking at um, the actual time series of these evolutionary dynamics. And it, this shows pretty clearly that it is these populations evolving high attack rates that are the ones going extinct. So we can also look at the average trajectories of these two different groups, uh, the populations that went extinct and the ones that didn't. And so with this magenta line, we see that it both um, was more steep in terms of evolving towards higher attack rates. Uh, <clears throat> whereas the extent populations ended up at, again, this lower attack rate, but also had less steep of an evolutionary trajectory. All right, so what does this all mean? Uh, first, it suggests that um, when we think about adaptive landscapes and uh, eco-evolutionary pathways, there might be some that are more viable than others. So these viable eco-evolutionary pathways that avoid these ecological boundaries might be the ones along which species are actually able to persist. It also suggests that there's a real importance of constraints and stochasticity 
So for example, again, if this population were to adjust evolve um, towards the strongest selection gradient, they would inevitably go extinct. But because of demographic stochasticity and genetic drift, we do end up having these populations that are able to persist over time. Uh, moreover, if there are constraints that keep species, uh, say like a trade-off that keeps species from evolving towards these high attack rates, um, the species in which those constraints exist may be better uh, able to persist. Lastly, this has some ramifications uh, for interpreting past evolution. For example, if these, uh, bound if these ecological boundaries are changing the evolutionary trajectories for populations that are persistent, um, it it's we can't really say that uh, the environment in the past was maybe pushed species to evolve along some trajectory if there is this component of chance and avoiding these boundaries. Um, so anyway, really excited about this idea and excited to share it for the first time. And with that, I'll take any questions anyone might have. So uh, we have a question from Andrew Hendry. Um, so beyond theory, how often do you think such extinctions actually occur? That is, how often do you think the constraints arise in reality? Yeah, I think that's a really tough question and something that I think um, particularly is uh, in the say Darwinian extinction and evolutionary suicide literature. There's a lot of talk about this of just how it's hard to observe these things because it has involved extinction. Um, so we do have some ideas about um, maybe some ways to proof of concept show that this might happen in the lab. Um, but yeah, I think it is just really hard to tell how often this might be the case. Uh, and you know, here we we don't have any trade-offs built into this, right? So species are just freely able. Uh, to evolve these lower handling times and higher attack rates. But say for something like body size, um, it was in the ecological uh, stability example, like, yeah, that's gonna trade off with so many different things that species are likely constrained in some ways where they might not actually be able to reach these boundaries. Cool. Um, we also have a question from Brian Lurch. What's the time scale for which this can explain ecological persistence? He said, if I'm understanding the model correctly, every population will eventually go extinct. Uh, so is this more buying time until evolutionary suicide will occur? Yeah, again, in this system, um, there are, uh, with the lack of trade-offs that we are built into it, then um, most either species will evolve to be extinct or actually in these models, um, trait variation can be degraded so much that there's not enough variance left in the population for it to really evolve much. And so that's another way in which, at least in these uh, mo in this modeling framework, you could, you could get that stoppage before you reach some um, parameter space in which you're likely to see extinction. And then even if the population succeeds in growing, you've lost that variation, right? So that-, that Yeah, so evolution can't happen anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do we have time for one more question? I think we do. Um, so Gilles asks, it seems that the extent, that the extant populations in your simulation are still doomed to extinction at some point in the future. Since the selection gradient points toward the top left region, right, would it perhaps be interesting to consider situations with alternative stable states where you can actually escape ultimate extinction by taking a suboptimal path that leads the population closer to an alternative attractor? Yeah, um, in this particular predator-prey model, uh, uh, there are no alternative stable states, right? You'd have to, you definitely have to use some more model with more complex uh, ecological stuff going on. But yeah, I, I would say this work does suggest that um, you might end up seeing maladaptive uh, or, or traits that look maladaptive just because they are traits that allow a population to persist over time. All right, so hey, I'm gonna um, stop sharing them. 
Yeah, we should uh, we should move on to the next talk. Thank you very much, Kyle, for a cool talk. I sent you another question on the on the comments. Um, right. The next talk will be by Zachary uh, Laubach, and it's a biologist guide to model selection and causal inference. Something we all need. Go for it, Zachary. Sorry, I'm muted. Cool. Um, so are folks able to, to see this, my screen? Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, my name is um, Zach Lawball and I wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to um, this talk today. So this talk is based on a collaboration between some EEB researchers and epidemiologists um, and a paper that's in press titled A Biologist's Guide to Model Selection and um, Causal Inference. So a common goal in biology is to understand how or why, and we usually start with an observation. And then next we might ask a question. So the question here being, why did the chicken cross the road? And then we often formulate a hypothesis. Um, a fox causes a chicken to cross the road. And so to answer our question and test our hypothesis, we collect data and then um, we use models to summarize the data and to draw inference. But biology, especially observed in natural um, settings, is rarely simple. So what variables do we include in our model and how should we interpret our results? Our results? And in short, the answer is it depends. So namely, it depends on our research question and what analysis should follow. So here I'll share a strategy commonly used by epidemiologists to analyze observational data and to draw a causal inference using an example from EEB. So this is a diagram, or this diagram is a roadmap um, to data analysis. And as you can see, it's broken into four steps, beginning with asking a research question and ending with results interpretation. So the first and key step to an analysis is to divine, define the research question and then decide on which data analysis task is appropriate. So there are four types of data analysis tasks, and these are description, prediction, association, and causal inference. So each task will help answer different questions and entails different modeling approaches. For example, when doing a descriptive study, the goal is to generate a quantitative summary of a variable or a few variables, variables of interest. Prediction involves identifying a collection of independent variables that explain a maximum amount of variation in a dependent variable. This discovery step should then be followed by a validation in an independent sample or study population. Both association and causal inference begin by identifying an explanatory variable X and an outcome Y. The causal relationship between these variables is in included in a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. And I'll discuss this um, in more detail later, what these DAGs are. The task of association proceeds with unadjusted models while causal inference typically involves models that include additional covariates that may confound, modify, or mediate the effect of X on Y. And I'll go over this with an, exam, an example momentarily, but this figure is just meant to summarize um, a systematic approach to data analysis. So before getting into more specifics about methods and models, I think it's worth mentioning what motivated this work. So I work on the Mara Hyena project and, and, and it, like um, other long-term field studies, generates large amounts of data. So when, when investigating questions with these data, the researcher faces the decision what variables should be included in their model. And this can be challenging, especially when the research goal is to test causal hypotheses using observational data. So in the remaining slides, I'm gonna walk through an example involving spotted hyenas and show how various data analysis tasks from our roadmap are applied in practice. And I'll also discuss an important tool that's widely used by epidemiologists, which is those directed acyclic graphs that I mentioned earlier. So this is a generic DAG. And DAGs are used, or yeah, or directed acyclic graph. I'll just call them DAGs from here on out. But um, DAGs are used to explicitly define study questions, to map out potential causal relationships between independent and dependent variables, and to summarize an analytical strategy. So variables are represented with boxes and relationships between variables are represented with single direction arrows that indicate the flow of time and the direction of causation. So we're often interested in an unbiased effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable. 
And to obtain this an un unbiased effect, we must control for confounding. So a confounder is a shared common cause of your independent and dependent variable of interest. And not accounting for such a variable in the analysis can lead to biased and or spurious associations. We may also want to control for um, precision variables, which help to minimize extraneous variation in either the exposure or the outcome. And finally, an intermediate variable occurs in between the independent and dependent variables and is part of the causal pathway. So this is a DAG representing the presumed causal and temporal relationships among multiple variables that we um, have hypothetically measured in our study population of spotted hyenas. So for example, C1 is pointing at X and Y, implying that it's a potential cause of X and a potential cause of Y. Whereas the arrow pointing from X to S indicates that X is a potential cause of S. So like biology, this is, this is pretty complex. However, just because we have these data doesn't mean we should include every single variable in our analyses. So how we decide to model these variables and the inference that we draw depends on our research question. So when first studying the type of animal, we may begin with the task of description. Here, the goal is to provide a quantitative overview of the data. We typically focus on a single variable, for instance, X, the social connectedness, or Y, immune function. And for this task, we might be asking, what is the central tendency and variation of T cell count in these wild spotted hyenas? We might also ask, what do individual social connectedness networks look like over the course of development from time one to time three? So for, for description, no prior or expert knowledge about the variables of interest is required. And that, that's an important um, piece to, to note. Another data analysis task is prediction. So here we are asking the question, what set of social and ecological factors explain maximum variation in the wild hyena immune function? So for prediction, we use prior or expert knowledge to select variables that may, re, may be related to our outcome. And then we can use any number of um, stepwise or automated approaches to identify a set of variables that maximize the explained variation in our outcome of interest. And these are, um, these are largely data-driven approaches that do not focus on the causal or temporal structures between our explanatory variables. So once the algorithm has been optimized with the training data set, a key component of prediction is to test the model's accuracy in an independent validation data set. And there are many methods available, including machine learning approaches for prediction. And this is, a, is an active area of development in EEB um, and other fields as well. Next is the data analysis task of association. So we again use expert knowledge to formulate the research question. And here we are asking, is social connectedness associated or correlated with immune function in wild hyenas? To answer this question, we model the simple association between our explanatory variable and our outcome. So we might control for precision covariates like storage time, which can improve precision of our estimate of association. We might also look at simple associations within strata of key covariates like sex. However, this task does not require controlling for confounders since we're not trying to control bias in order to make causal inference. Here, we're, we're simply trying to understand raw associations. So while association does not allow us to make causal inference, this task has the benefit of requiring the researcher to make fewer assumptions when constructing their model. And this type of analysis is often used as an informative first step prior to ca causal inference analysis. Um, or, or it can be implemented when the data and or analytical techniques required to make causal inference are not feasible. Okay, so finally there's the, the task of causal inference. And there are, there are two broad endpoints of interest for causal inference models, including models that quantify the total effect of X on Y and models that partition the, the total effect into direct and indirect effects. So in both cases, the goal is to test a causal hypothesis and hear expert knowledge regarding the interrelations and the temporality of X, Y, and various third variables like confounders and mediators are required. So if, we're, we, if our research question um, yeah, in, if we are interested in a research question involving the total effects of X on Y, we might ask, what is the effect of social connectedness on, a few, on immune function in wild hyenas? And, and in order to answer this question and test this hypothesis, we need to build a model that quantifies the total effect of social connectedness 
on immune function while controlling for bias. So this means that we must control for confounders up to the relationship of interest. So let's assume, for example, that there is no effect of social connectedness on immune function, but the geographical region where a hyena lives is a determinant of both X and Y. Here, a shared common cause of X and Y, like geographical region, opens what is known as a backdoor path between the social connectedness and the immune function and can lead to spurious associations between the two variables. So this is that um, represented by the red arrow that, that actually came in a little bit early. Um, so for instance, you can imagine that the association between social connectedness and immune function may transpire from the fact that hyenas in a certain geographical region have lower social connectedness and lower immune function due to human disturbance. But that the, that the association that transpires from the confounding effect of human disturbance is not a causal one. It's one that occurs due to geographical region. But we are interested in the effect of social connectedness on immune function. So thus we, we need to control for geographical region in order to block the backdoor path and isolate the causal effect of social connectedness on immune function. Okay, so what about these other variables? For example, there are, there are additional backdoor paths through the confounder C2, social rank, and through C2 and C3, in which diet is a direct descendant of social rank. And by examining in our DAG, we can see that social rank is a shared common cause of social connectedness and diet. So in, in our model, we can block the backdoor path between social connectedness and immune function simply by controlling for social rank. So this will also block the path that, that goes through C3 and thus controlling for any effect of diet. And in this case, it makes most sense to control for social rank given that it's upstream of diet and because social rank is more reliably measured, um, a more reliable measurement than say a, um, a hyena's diet. And that brings us to the second broad category of causal inference models. And here the goal is to quantify direct and indirect effects in what is commonly known as mediation analyses. So as the name implies, mediation analyses often investigate um, biological mechanisms that link our explanatory and outcome variables. Uh, for an example, Dr. Um, Liz Lang presented on this topic yesterday, so you should check out her empirical work. Um, in our spotted hyena example, we might ask, to what extent is the effect of social connectedness on immune function mediated by stress hormones in wild hyenas? So for simplicity, let's remove all other variables except our explanatory variable, our potential mediator, and our outcome of interest. In order to partition the variation in Y that is explained by our explanatory variable and our mediator, we can use this equation in which the total effect of social connectedness on immune function is the sum of the indirect effect that passes through our mediator cortisol plus the direct effect of social connectedness on immune function that is not due to cortisol. And we can start by, by estimating the total effect of X on Y. Next, in a model that, include, that includes X, M, and Y, we can condition on our mediator and estimate the direct effect of X on Y that does not pass through M. Then the difference in the estimates for our total effect minus our direct effect gives us this indirect effect of X on Y that passes through M. So for example, if there's complete mediation between social connectedness and immune function by cortisol, the direct effect would be zero. Now there are multiple methods that can be used for conducting um, mediation analyses, which each require various assumptions, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna discuss those um, or those methods today. It's also important to note here that mediation analyses do not ignore confounding variables and th that these would need to be um, controlled for in our models. So before concluding, I think it's important to reiterate that causal inference does not imply control for everything. So you likely notice variables in our original DAG that have been skipped over or only briefly mentioned. And we'll address these under the premise that our research question is again about total effect. So here for this final example, we're asking, does social connectedness cause differences in immune function in wild hyenas? So first, when our research question is about total effects, we should not control for mediators as this will lead to null biased estimates. Second, we should not control for reproductive state or, aff or affiliative preference. <clears throat> so as indicated by the, the arrows in this DAG, 
both social connectedness and immune function influence reproductive state, which make this variable what is called a collider. And conditioning on a collider opens a backdoor path between X and Y that otherwise was closed. So this can lead to collider bias, which results in flipping the estimate of interest or, or um, a spurious association between X and Y, even if no, so, no such association exists. And then finally, we can exclude or include um, uh, precision covariates like sample storage time that only affect our outcome or explanatory variable based on whether or not inclusion of these variables improve the precision of our estimate. And the main point here is that um, the statistical significance of associations between third variables and either explanatory or outcome variable of interest alone does not justify including that variable in the model, as this can introduce bias, just like omitting a confounding variable can also introduce bias. So like, um, like epidemiologists, EB researchers are often presented with large observational data with measurements on many variables. So given a collection of variables, we need to ask how, or we, we should decide how we choose to model the data. And this depends on um, clearly defining our study question. Next, we should decide on an appropriate data analysis task or tasks. So it's worth noting that these tasks can be used together in a research project. We should also use directed acyclic graphs to map out hypotheses and to incorporate expert knowledge into our analysis plan. DAGs also inform our model specification and importantly, these can help identify sources of measured and unmeasured confounding. And then finally, we should um, interpret and describe results based on our research question um, and which data analysis task that we, that we end up using. So here we should discuss the potential sources of bias and alternative hy hypotheses as highlighted by our DAG. Uh, Doctor, you have four minutes. Perfect, I'm almost, I'm almost done, thanks. Um, yeah, these methods will not replace randomized experiments in seeking to understand causation, but these can provide a viable option for testing causal hypotheses, um, especially when using observational data and when experiments are not feasible or, or ethical. So if there, if there ends up being any time um, for questions before we get to those, I just wanna acknowledge um, some funding sources um, and um, the work of, of numerous causal inference um, epidemiologists, including uh, Dr. Jessica Young, whose research and ideas helped to shape our, our paper. And lastly, I wanted to say thanks for everybody for taking the time to listen. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. That was great. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I wanted to ask you, so it seems like the, the beginning point and the end point of your DAGs are pretty well defined. And then in the middle, you have a lot of things. How, how do you make the decision between classifying different pieces of that middle section as, you know, either confounders or intermediate variables or any of those other types that you were discussing? Yeah, that's a really great Great question. Um, so this, I guess this is, um, I'll just go to this, this DAG in particular. This is where um, pre previous um, so, sort of expert knowledge and um, work that has been done in, on the system is, is required. Um, so you, you might, yeah, if you just start studying the system, you might not know the, the temporality or how some of these, these variables in the, the middle are related to each other. But hopefully as the system becomes um, sort of more developed, especially in some of these long-term studies, you can you, you get a sense for um, you know what what precedes what um, in terms of and, and that's a that's a big component of, of it I guess you can't overlook the temporality aspect of it for sure um, thank you then we also have a question from Bob um, Bob says awesome talk Zachary does it make sense to include uh, causal feedback i.e removing the a in DAG for example feedbacks between ecological and evolutionary dynamics S um, sure, um, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding, but I'll, I'll go with what I've gotten, but I'm happy to chat with um, Bob afterwards. So I, I think some of these, um, yeah, some of these, these variables could, could be certainly on an ecological or, or evolutionary scale. The, the whether or not there's a, an actual feedback loop or a double headed arrow that, that does not come into, um, into to the, the model is yeah becomes very challenging to to model so the DAGs are explicitly um, one directional um, yeah and would have to identify that 
I guess you would have to be explicit about this possibility of a, of, of a feedback loop if that existed. Great, thanks so much, Zachary. That was an awesome talk. Thanks. Okay, so it's time to get started again. Uh, again, this is the contributed uh, paper section 10 from the virtual Asilomar American Society of Naturalists meeting. Uh, and this contributed paper session is titled Methods, Models, and Perspectives. And so we have the last set of talks uh, for the conference prior to the natural history uh, trivia. And the first of those will be by uh, Matthew Kustra talking about non-directional cryptic female choice, maintaining variation in ejaculate traits. Go for it, Matthew. Thank you. Um, can people hear me and see the cursor and desktop? Looks good. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for taking the time to watch this and for all the organizers and moderators for making this possible. And my talk today is on a model that I developed with my advisor, Susanna Alonzo, uh, to ask questions on the maintenance of variation in post copulatory sexually selected traits. And I really first became interested in this question because of the diversity of sperm. And so we actually look across the animal kingdom. Sperm are some of the most diverse cells in rapidly evolving cells. And so while we're familiar with sort of the tadpole shaped sperm cell, we also have cells that, sperm cells that even lack flagellums, have multiple flagellums, and have all sorts of different crazy shapes and sizes. And the vast diversity of sperm suggests that sperm traits such as morphology, but other things are under strong selection and we might expect that strong selection should degrade genetic variation. However, when we look within species and within populations, we often find that there's tends to be a decent amount of heritability and variation in sperm traits. And so part of question that's sort of outstanding is how is this variation maintained? And one proposed mechanism that's been verbal but not formally tested using theory is something called non-directional cryptic female choice. And to back up a bit, we mostly think of female choice, we think of pre -copatory. Um, So females choosing to mate on a male based off of some sort of trait, like an ornament. However, this is only half the story. In many species, females mate with more than one male, and this can result in post copulatory sexual selection or selection on traits that aided fertilization success. And this is where cryptic female choice happens. It's when females bias fertilization towards specific males. And by non-directional cryptic female choice, I mean that there's this male by female interaction. So say for example, if one female mates with two different males, male one and male two, um, with, in this scenario, we see that male two consistently sires 80% of the offspring. However, if there's a different female with the same males, we might see that paternity is reversed. So, male one sires the majority of the offspring consistently. And so these male by female interactions are what we call non-directional cryptic female choice. And there's been growing evidence that this process happens in wide, vari uh, wide, wide variety of species, including species with both internal fertilization and external fertilization. And so I developed a model trying to ask the main question being does these male by female interactions or non-directional cryptic female choice, does that help maintain genetic variation compared to other types of selection? Do trade-offs help maintain genetic variation and other proposed mechanisms? So say sperm count trading off of sperm size. And finally, interested in how risk of sperm competition. So the probability of female mates with more than one male influences this as well as the strength of selection and particularly the, how they interact with one another. And so to do that, we developed an individual-based model. And so the individuals in this model are either male or female. And so males express some sort of nondescript male sperm traits. So we could think of that maybe potentially as sperm length. And it's completely determined by the genotype. And so for each trait or the, each trait, we have two different loci. And because they're sexually diploid, they get a copy from both parents. 
but it's only the male traits only expressed in the male. Then we have a female choice trait, which only comes into play under the non-directional cryptic female choice part. And once again, completely sex bias expression, only expressed in females, but both males and females carry that. And in terms of what traits these might be in a biological real example, we might think that male sperm trait could be say sperm length and the female and the choice trait could be the reproductive length, which at least comparative studies show that these often correlate evolution with one another. And then finally, I'm also modeling sperm number. And this is so we can get at that trade-off. And so when there is a trade-off, I'm assuming that sperm number is inversely proportional to male traits. So if you have higher value of male sperm trait, you're gonna have lower values of sperm number. Um, with the no trade-off model, I'm still including sperm number, but it's separately controlled genetically. And so once again, the parameters of interest. So I'm gonna vary risk of sperm competition. So the probability of female mates with more than one male. And then I'm gonna look at four different types of selection. So you can imagine it being a fair raffle. So where there's no direct selection on the male sperm trait. All that matters is which male produces the same, the most sperm number. Finally, um, just to shorten it, I'm gonna, matching selection, which is the non-directional cryptic female choice. I call it matching is because you can think of each female having an optimum and the best, um, the male that matches that optimum has higher fertilization success. Directional selection, so always larger in that male sperm trait value is better and stabilizing selection. So there's some sort of fixed optimum. And then I'm gonna look at the strength of selection. And so what this looks like, I'm just gonna go over all of them. Um, so this is all assuming that sperm count is held constant. And so on the Y axis, we have the probability of fertilization. On the X axis is different values of the focal male trait value. On the red, a dashed line is the optimum trait value. Blue is the competitor trait value. And then the different lines represent the different strengths of selection. So in this cartoon example, in this example, the male competitor is at 40, the optimum is at around 99. And so say focal male is around 50. Under weak selection, the focal male has around like a 70-ish percent probability of fertilization, holding sperm count um, the same. Under moderate selection, that same difference results in 80%. And then under strong selection, that's almost 100% probability of fertilization. Stabilizing selection is very similar, except the same equation, except for that optimum is set sort of at that starting average of the populations. And if you can notice here is that it's symmetric. So it doesn't matter whether or not you're greater or less than, it just matters how close you are relative to your competitor. And the way, like I mentioned before, that we can think of matching selection or just non-directional cryptic female choice is that each female with the female choice trait value creates their own optimum. And so this is the model process. So I start a population of equal sex ratio at 500 individuals. And we also tested um, this at 1,000, but results are qualitatively similar, so I just focus on 500. And then each female randomly mates with at least one male with some probability, which is that risk of sperm competition, second male. Each female produces 10 offspring, and then the paternity of which is determined by the two males, um, both by the sperm count and the sperm trait using those functions that I showed before. The way sperm count comes in is that the values from, that, from those equations that I showed weight the sperm number. And then finally, the offspring genotype is determined by making a quote unquote sperm and egg. And so I'm also allowing mutation in this model to take place. And then we return to the original population size and sex ratio by randomly sampling from the offspring. And then I'm repeating this for 500 generations. I did run a subset to a thousand generations, but things generally stabilize by 400 generations. And then because there's uh, stochasticity in this model, 
I modeled five, 50 different populations per parameter combination to get at some of that variation. And so right now I'm just gonna show a subset of what this might look like, the evolutionary dynamics. Um, this is with weak, this is with a moderate strength of selection and 50% risk of sperm competition. So each female may, has a probability of mating with another male 50% of the time. And there's also no trade-off. And so up here is the average trait value, red being the female choice trait value, blue being the male sperm trait value. And this is the coefficient of variation in that trait value. And then on the x-axis of the generation. And so we can see with matching selection that the female and male trait tend to co-evolve with one another. They match each other, which is what we expect. And variation generally declines with males. And then let's get to the next. With directional, we see that the male trait value evolves quickly. And once again, in this model, there's no selection acting on that female choice rate value. And then with coefficient of variation, there's a rapid decline. And then whenever there's a new mutation, you do see peaks of coefficient of variation during that selective sweep. Under stabilizing selection, because I set the optimum to the average, the trait value doesn't really change the average trait value amongst the different populations. But we, see, do, we do see that coefficient of variation rapidly declines. And then finally, fair raffle, you can sort of think it as like a base case. In this case, because there's no trade-off, there's no selection going on. And so both trades are just drifting. And putting it all together, just as just like one subset of our analysis, we see this is what we just saw. And then we see that it looks like variation tends to be higher in matching selection. But what we wanted to do is lift all the different parameters we ran. I took the average and then bootstrap the average so we can compare it. And so for now, and so I'll walk through some of the main results. And so on the y-axis, we have that coefficient of variation of that male sperm trait. On the x-axis is different risks of sperm competition. So 0.5 would mean each female has a 50% chance of mating with another male. And the different types of line indicates whether there is a trade-off with the dotted or straight line is no trade-off. And so just starting off with fair raffle. So fair raffle without a trade-off, once they, like I said before, meant that there's no direct selection acting up. There's no selection at all. It's just drifting. And what you can see is that sperm, risk of sperm competition doesn't matter. You get that interaction with a trade-off because you actually have indirect selection for smaller male trait values because remember, it's inversely proportional, which you see over here. And then finally, with matching selection, we see that matching selection generally maintains more genetic variation than both stabilizing and directional. And something else we can note here is that the presence of trade-offs, except for in fair raffle when we expected it to be, generally doesn't make that big of a difference in terms of the maintenance of variation. Um, do you see this interaction effect between risk of sperm competition? So there doesn't seem to, risk of sperm competition doesn't generally matter for directional selection, this darker blue but it does for stabilizing and matching. And because um, stabilizing selection, do see a sharp decline when there's risk of sperm competition increases? Um, at least at low risk of sperm competition, stabilizing tends to maintain more variation than directional selection. And I said that. And so then we can look at moderate selection and we see that it's pretty, it's a very similar pattern. The main difference is that directional selection now tends to maintain more genetic variation than stabilizing selection. And then when we look at strong selection, we can see that stabilizing selection, pretty much everything goes to fixation. And we do see that matching and directional selection tend to maintain about the same amount of genetic variation. And then when we put it all together, um, just sort of 
Oh. And then so with weak, and then putting it all together, we can see that as strength of selection increases um, for both directional stabilizing and matching, we tend to see a decline in variation. And there's also this interesting interaction in terms of the effective risk of sperm competition. So under weak selection, we do see that as risk of sperm competition increases, at least for stabilizing and matching selection, there is a decline in genetic variation. However, that slope, as you can notice, uh, goes away under strong selection where risk of sperm competition doesn't seem to matter in terms of understanding the amount of variation maintained. And so main conclusions are that male by female interactions generally can help maintain genetic variation, especially under weak and moderate selection. Um, surprisingly, trade-offs do have a limited effects on the maintenance of genetic variation, at least the trade-offs I explored here. There are four minutes left. Oh, thanks. And then genetic variation tends to decline with risk of sperm competition, but this effect weakens as the strength of selection increases. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Suzanne Alonzo, National Science Foundation, my lab mates, and folks at the Biology of Sperm Conference that helped put inputs when I was at the beginning of developing this model. And I'd be happy to take any questions. I have one in bar if there aren't any in. Uh, um, there's, there's one from Maddie. Um, if a large it. variation in sperm traits is only seen in a fair raffle situation, Sorry, my Slack went all weird for a sec. Oh, there we go, okay. Uh, how common is that fair raffle in nature? Uh, that, I would say generally it's unlikely that spur traits did, wouldn't matter, um, but there are definitely in some examples where at least experimentally, it seems like sperm loss, it doesn't matter as much as sperm count. Okay, um, Matthew, I'll ask a question. Um, and it's, of course, it's appropriate that the last question came from Maddie because her work is also looking at another mechanism maintaining variants within populations. Uh, and so I'm, what I'm curious about is, um, to what extent the classical mechanisms suggested to maintain variants despite selection might alter the outcome of these uh, simulations. For example, if you added negative frequency dependent selection or temporal variation selection or spatial variation and coupled with gene flow, would those things just overwhelm the results you're finding here? Or would these emerge even in the context of these other forces? Um, I mean, that's a great question, and that's definitely something I want to explore more. Um, in terms, I can't, I honestly can't make a great guess on that. Um, yeah, but that's, that's definitely a great future direction. Yeah, it's one of these classic things where it's, it's like a, a question with too many solutions almost. And both you and Maddie have advanced further ones. Um, it's just really interesting that so many things can contribute to this process and we have difficulty knowing which are the most important. Um, so if you will indulge me, how do sperm move without flagella? You brought uh, that up in your I'm intro. I'm not an expert at that. Uh, I believe that it's like an amoeba. Um, it is an amoeboid like shape or like crawl, but that's, I find that very weird, but. And then, um, yeah, I believe a lot of those ones are from crustaceans. I don't know the exact species, but. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Uh, we'll move on to the next talk now. So the next talk is by John Harper. And he will be talking to us about sexual antagonism in humans, loci and evidence. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah, this is my talk. Um, before I start, uh, I, it is 11 o'clock here in England. So my apologies if I'm a bit 
seem a bit tired, a bit slow. Um, so yes, yeah, so my talk is about sexual antagonism in humans. Um, so I am a PhD student at University of Sussex and Ted Morrow is my supervisor. Um, so I'm going to start, we already heard about what sexual antagonism is from Thomas's talk earlier, but uh, in case you didn't, in case for people who weren't around, um, sexual antagonism is about when we have a trait which is beneficial if possessed by one sex, but deleterious in the other. And what are, the big horn sheep is a classic example of this. Males would want to have bigger horns because big horns are useful for competing against other mates um, when they're when they're trying to um, when they're competing in sexual selection. However, these horns are not particularly useful in dealing with predators. Whereas females will want smaller horns, smaller dagger-like horns, so they're able to actually stab predators to ward them off their young. Um, so for a male to have small horns, they would not do very well. They would be unable to breed. They'd be able to fend off other males and mate. Whereas for females having big horns, they're kind of useless for dealing with predators. So what you have here is one trait in different directions being beneficial and deleterious to different sexes. So what we really want to find out uh, for, from an evolutionary perspective is how common actually is sexual antagonism? There's been a lot of work done on this um, and it's widely believed that it's very widespread. Pretty much every taxa where it has sex is found to have sexual antagonism to a degree in various different predictions from modeling and genomic studies. Despite this, there aren't very many examples of specific loci. So within genes or particular bases in the genes in the DNA, where we know that they have a sexually antagonistic effect. So the Barson paper revealed that there was a salmon example, and there have been a few discovered in Drosophila, but for the most part, there aren't many, very many concrete examples of sexually antagonistic loci. Um, and at the same time, uh, there is plenty of evidence of sexual antagonism. And of course, sexual dimorphism is known to be very widespread. Um, pretty much every species which has any kind of any sex at all um, has dimorphism to a different extent. Dimorphisms are not always um, physically obvious as well. There can be many um, less obvious changes in biochemistry. It's not just morphological traits. So is there sexual antagonism in humans? So there is definitely sexual dimorphism in humans, and uh, there are very big differences in sex in diseases, particularly if you look at cancers. So this study looked at the different instances of human cancers. And if you look at the top cancers in either sex, you see a really strong dimorphism. Like you have ovary cancer, for example, the females and prostate cancer. They're both pretty big cancers in males and females but they're virtually absent in the opposite sex. So we see this huge dimorphism in humans. So could there also be sexually antagonistic loci? We don't know of any actual examples of sexually antagonistic human loci, or at least that used to be true. Because we set out to search for examples of human loci, human alleles or loci, which are sexually antagonistic. So why, do, why don't we know of any? Why are we not finding any? So we had an idea. We decided to look at this in two different stages. The first stage would be looking for these loci using search terms used by evolutionary biologists. So terms like sexual antagonism, sexually antagonistic, and intralocus sexual conflict. So we thought about how evolutionary biologists would describe sexual antagonism, and we filtered for humans. Uh, the search returned about 34 papers, but none of them actually named specific loci, as we expected, because we didn't believe any had actually been found. But then we had another thought. What if people have found sexually antagonistic loci, but they didn't know that's what they were? Biomedical science is a huge field, and lots of different studies are going on at any one time. Could any of them have found sexually antagonistic loci and not known what it was? So we started to think about how 
said people might describe sexual antagonism if you didn't know sex what sexual antagonism was as a concept how would you describe it so we started putting together words like sex gender male and female but not just that men and women as well and boys and girls because these are human studies they wouldn't necessarily just say humans in the script or male or female even and we combine those with any kind of word which would refer to the locus loci gene polymorphism a specific genetic structure so this search returned many, many more papers in PubMed, 881, and we screened, went through all these papers and screened them, and we discovered that 32 of these papers describe loci. In total, there were 51, which had solid evidence of a different effect in each sex. So not just an effect in each sex, but an effect in opposite directions. So what were these loci that we discovered? Uh, there were 21 which we decided we called complex traits and these would be what we mean by complex traits would be things like waist hip ratio so the rationale for splitting these is because we wanted to be sure that these were actually having an effect on fitness complex traits we couldn't be sure you could infer perhaps that having a high bmi is detrimental to fitness you're more likely to be unhealthy you're more likely to die young um, and similar things with high blood pressure but you cannot really say that these are definitively selection related. It's difficult to actually make that inference. You can perhaps argue it could be, but there is, ambi there, there is a room for ambiguity in these ones. The others less so. So we had 19 disease risk and severity traits across 21 different loci. So these would be things like cancers. So a gene as locus or an allele, for example, which would increase the rate of cancer in one sex, but decrease it in the other or perhaps increase severity or um, make, progno uh, make, make the prognosis of said cancer worse. So that's what we mean by disease risk severity. In no case were these referred to as sexually antagonistic. And in one example, a paper had discovered an effect in different directions, but it dismissed it as a false positive, which we think might mean that actually there's even more out there we've not discovered. Uh, uh, and I've never made it to publication simply because researchers have looked at the results and gone, ah, these are rubbish and bin them. And also, unfortunately, none of these were validated or independently replicated by another study. So in no case were we able to observe the effect of the same locus in several different studies. So this first thing I want you to take away from this is these exist. They're around. They're out there. Next is going to require a bit more thinking um because we wanted to have a look at whether or not these alleles behaved in a way which was predicted by any of the past models of sexual antagonism so there have been lots of theoretical studies of the sexual antagonism and how these antagonistic alleles might behave so we decided to try and test some of these so the metric we were really interested in is what we call effect size ratio um, so each sexually antagonistic allele by, by definition has a beneficial effect in one sex and a deleterious effect in the other sex. The metric we used looked at the ratio between these. We divide the positive effect, which would be a positive number, by the negative effect, which is going to be a negative number, to produce a negative number, as is always going to be the case for a sexually antagonistic locus. On this graph, if you look at the x-axis which is the effect size ratio the alleles which are more to the left will have a net positive effect so there will be a more negative number but a bigger magnitude number as you move left these are going to have a stronger positive effect and a smaller negative effect as a consequence so our hypothesis was that these alleles uh, as would make as would just kind of make logical sense because their beneficial effects are bigger than the deleterious effects they're going to be more like beneficial alleles overall they will be balanced a bit by the negative effect but they're going to be more like positive and therefore we would expect that they would move to a higher allele frequency conversely we have negative alleles which have got a larger negative effect and a smaller uh, beneficial effect their effect size is going to be um, relative, it's going to be, its magnitude is going to be smaller, 
but it's going to be less negative. It's going to be more over to the right of the axis we have here. And minus one, the point at which you've got equal effect sizes is going to be sort of like the tipping point. So everything shaded blue is going to be more like a, every shaded white, sorry, is going to be more like a beneficial allele and everything to the, in the red zone is going to be more like a deleterious allele. So is that what we see? So we examined these traits. Uh, if you, if first of all, by um, stratifying them according to their trait class, unfortunately, we didn't really find anything. There's uh, not enough points in either one to find uh, any statistically significant relationship. It's really a power issue from the low sample size. But if you combine both trait classes together, ones which confer disease risk and severity traits and complex traits, we find quite a strong negative relationship. As we would expect, more beneficial alleles have got higher effect allele frequencies, whereas more negative ones have got lower. Um, and these points are weighted as well. So we weighted according to um, variance. So points which have got a lower variance have got a higher weighting because we're more sure of where they are. Um, and you can see our statistics down here. We had quite a significant p-value. So we actually have this really solid trend. Um, and we tried several different modeling methods to try and find the best fit. And it was significant in many different ones. So that's the second thing I want you to take away from this uh, talk is that not only do these alleles exist, but they also behave in accordance with predictions made um, from previous models and previous statistical models and simulations. So really there is kind of a wider point as well to be made. It's the fact that this different terminology has prevented these examples from being communicated. Evolutionary biologists have been looking for human sexual and sexual and sexually antagonistic loci in humans for a long time and haven't dis they haven't discovered them because there's been this terminology gap here because they've been not been thinking about how medics would perhaps describe them. Um, however, we do need to be really, really sure that these are sexually antagonistic loci. We need some more independent validation, which would have to come really from um, the biomedical scientists. So all of this information and more is available in the preprint over on Med Archive. Um, so if you are interested, please go and check that out. Um, and that brings me to the end of my talk. So thanks very much to Ted Morrow and Tim Janicki, so my supervisor and the collaborator on this project. And also to the people who commented on the manuscript, Jessica Abbott, Tim Conlon and Philip Bruzica. Uh, you can contact me on that address there. And thanks everyone for listening, um, both Zoom and also YouTube and people from the future on YouTube watching this back. <laughs> thanks for watching. Um, any questions? Great. Um, so we have a we have a question from uh, Andrew. Andrew, do you want to verbalize it or should I read it? I can say it out loud. That's fine. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, well, I mean, it's really fascinating that you have um, just you changed the search terms to find, you know, a bunch of missing literature, but then also your inference that what you're finding seems to suggest that basically there's a publication bias against sexually antagonistic loci. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any way to formally assess the magnitude of that bias. So for example, you know, people use funnel plots and meta analyses and other sorts of things like that to try to assess the extent of publication bias. Is there any way that you can see formally doing that to get sort of a better estimate of the average overall effect and number of sexually antagonistic loci? That's a very tricky question um, because even if we were able to go over everything, we'd still have the issue of people who have, um, because there's always a pressure to find results, to find positive results, um, which would drive people who discover, like they, who don't stratify by sex, who discover a sex, sexually antagonistic effect and go, well, this is rubbish. It can't be opposite in males and females. This is either gonna be a disease risk gene or it's not. Um, we did try looking into other databases, um, but it's really quite a mammoth task, really, 
because this is not just you no know, most meta analysis will be looking for one statistic one value to come out of it but the problem is that none of these studies are looking at precisely the same thing they're looking at their own candidate genes and candidate alleles and the effects of said alleles so i'm not really sure how one would go about actually trying to assess the bias itself um but i imagine it wouldn't be a very easy task at all but it would be very very interesting though uh, we have plenty of time so i'll, I'll ask a follow-up question um so another way that one might potentially get a hint of this is again seeing if studies that had you know smaller sample sizes are less likely to report these sexually antagonistic uh, uh, alleles or loci. Um, and another way is to look at the publication, um, like effect size variance through date of publication, right? Because people may be more willing or less, depending, to accept the sexually antagonistic results and publish them as time goes on. Yeah. So we did, we did look at the kind of the years of publication. Um, there wasn't anything massively meaningful we could, convert, can, could, could sort of take from it. But um, generally we do see that. So it's more common that you would see these papers. Some, a lot of these papers would be from sort of the 2010s and later. Um, there weren't very many at all um, sort of before 2000. It's quite a recent real thing that the people have actually been, perhaps because of more awareness in gender differences in medicine, that it's only fairly recently that they've actually really been properly documenting these things. Um, and the power issue is quite a big one. So um, anyone who's doing a study into a gene, if they stratify by sex, then they're cutting their sample size in half or depending on the sex ratio. So they're gonna lose power from that, which is something they'll be less likely to do. And as a result, that then also makes it less likely that they would find and report um, a sex different effect or a sexually antagonistic effect. Those are all really good points, John. Um, and also there's, I know in a lot of animal studies, often only males are studied, for example. Um, mm. I wonder if that's in humans too. So we have a few more questions. Uh, hopefully we can get to all of them. So first we have one, this one is on Slack from Andreas. Um, have you looked at all at the geographic distribution of these sexually antagonistic alleles? And are they limited to just some populations? Do you have any sense of that? Yeah, okay. Um, so sort of is the answer to that one, I guess. Um, each study discovered an allele and they will have their own study populations. And the vast majority of said studies would be looking at one population in one area. So um, they'd be looking at speed dating success in, um, I can't remember where that one was actually, but there was a schizophrenia in Koreans, for example, study, um, various things like that. So they were focused on particular populations. However, um, we looked at allele frequencies in different populations of these, of these SNPs um, and compared them sort of different from, so not, quite geographical areas, but sort of different populations, different uh, races, I suppose. Um, and we found that for the, the pretty much every allele is present in every population to some degree, the frequencies do vary. Um, I don't think there were very many which massively varied in frequency. Um, but it would be interesting to do a more detailed analysis of that to actually find out whether or not, because the environments are going to be different, the selection pressures will be different. And it'd be interesting to see if these effects are actually um, persistent over different communities and different societies. We have another question from Thomas. Um, he wanted to know what was the relative proportion of loci that you found on the X versus on the autosomes? Um, so we actually found zero on the X chromosome, um, which is quite interesting. Um, there was no, so for the rest of the autosome, just quickly there, we didn't find any particular enrichment in any specific area. Um, but there were no, there were no examples on the X chromosomes or, or Y chromosome by extension, um, 
that could be because of uh, the publication bias and the um, sex bias that we mentioned earlier. Um, because again, if you've only got a disease, if you've got a disease allele which is only on one sex chromosome, then that's perhaps going to be more complicated for people to study, uh, and they wouldn't necessarily be able to, in some cases, look at sex and uh, sexually antagonistic effects. Okay, um, we, should, um, we should transition yeah. to the next speaker now to make sure that we stay on time. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Simon, you great. have you have a few questions on the Slack channel, so you can check that out. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you again, John. Uh, the next talk is by Samuel Scarpino, and he's going to talk about the effect of spatial hierarchy and metapopulation structure on the shape of COVID-19 epidemics. Great, thank you very much. And you can see the slides, everybody, or at least everybody that's here. Yes, okay, great. All right, well, um, thank you all uh, very much for being here this evening or morning or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, I know that personally, I wish we were all together in Asilomar um, for a whole variety of reasons, but I think continuing to do these kinds of events where we can come together and talk about science uh, and give people an opportunity to share what they've been working on are perhaps even more important now than uh, than they've ever been. So uh, to the organizers, I certainly understand the effort and dedication it takes to pull something together like this. So thank you all very much. Um, and today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some work uh, we've been doing on the spatial hierarchy and metapopulation structure of COVID-19. Um, this is heavily motivated by uh, some classical work in ecology having to do with the effect of crowding uh, on animal populations, or really the effect of crowding uh, as, as first proposed by Lloyd in 67 on perhaps nearly everything that we think about in uh, ecoevolutionary dynamics. Before we do that, um, I want to mention just very briefly a project that uh, we've been working on since about this time last year, and, and this is also motivated by one of the things that I think is uh, incredibly important about this community uh, and that we can bring out into the broader community of people that are working on uh, eco-evolutionary dynamics, whether that's in human populations as it pertains to COVID or whether that's in animal or plant uh, populations, as many of the talks we've heard about today. And that's the importance of data uh, and, and large comparative data sets that we can use to answer questions or at least ask questions uh, about uh, things that are of relevance either into human populations or in general to science. And so we've been working uh, with about 100 volunteers uh, now supported by a variety of, of foundations uh, and technology companies to curate a large anonymized individual level data set of COVID-19 cases. Uh, we were fortunate to have this covered by New York Times Magazine back at the beginning of the summer. Uh, now, uh, so we at the time of printing, we had 142 countries with a little over a million cases uh, of COVID-19. Uh, this number now is up to about 5 million cases, and these are all hosted and have been on an open uh, open database uh, since, since the very beginning uh, as we've been capturing uh, these data. And fortunate to have the support of a, a diverse international consortium of colleagues now that are working under the auspices of an organization that we're calling Global.Health uh, to continue to build out these data and make them available uh, internationally so that uh, researchers and public health officials can learn more about COVID and, and respond to it. The talk that I've been giving about COVID-19 starts with a slide that says COVID-19 became a pandemic because the world doesn't understand complex systems. And I'm often talking to individuals that are interested in complex networks, so I put networks in parentheses. We could replace this with uh, the world doesn't understand fundamental theory and ecology and evolution. I put an asterisk here because I certainly don't either. Uh, one of the things that I have realized as I was going about this is that I should have paid attention uh, in some of the classes in graduate school a little bit more carefully because it turns out that a lot of this stuff that we're grappling with now was, was fairly well understood from a, a theoretical perspective 50 years ago uh, or more. And so I think one of the things that's really important for us to remember, and a lot of you have contributed on the COVID front, uh, either as a volunteer uh, or, or leading uh, research efforts, one of the things that's important for us to remember is that when people talk about uh, researchers staying in their lane or epistemological trespass, what they're really talking about is people being jerks uh, and not coming into a field with uh, an open interest in collaboration uh, and, and integrative science. They're not talking about uh, keeping barriers between ourselves. They're not talking about how interdisciplinary science is not the path forward for, for COVID and so many other things. So I really, I want 
individuals on this call that maybe have or on this in the listening that that have thought perhaps that that they can't or shouldn't contribute uh, to research around COVID-19 because it's not in their area of expertise. Uh, it certainly wasn't in mine uh, until I was a postdoc. I started uh, working with Professor Linda Delph at Indiana on quantitative genetics uh, in the field and in the lab and, and initially worked with, with Mark Kirkpatrick uh, as an empirical population geneticist. Not surprisingly, that, that didn't last very long uh, and, and moved into more theoretical work. So really, it's important that we remember that a lot of what we learn as uh, ecologists, evolutionary biologists, uh, has quite a bit to say about COVID uh, and, and many other things. So what, about, what do I mean by this? Well, it turns out that some of the things that we have gotten wrong, and I'm not going to say who we is here, uh, I'm happy to do that over beers, but that we have gotten wrong about COVID-19 go kind of all the way back to the very beginnings of things that, that have been worked on in ecological theory, in particular around population growth and population dynamics. So what do I mean? Well, here's a picture of an individual with 1918 flu. Here's a picture of individuals responding to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. One of the most common numbers that we might use to describe these outbreaks is the R0 or the R0. It's approximately the average number of secondary infections that has a much more specific definition, uh, which means it's almost never relevant for uh, diseases in finite population sizes, but you could think about this as the average number of secondary infections. It's approximately the same, too, for both of these diseases, with the important caveat that I do understand that saying something that's nonlinear is approximately the same is, is approximately meaningless, but it's about two. However, 1918 flu, half a billion people, a bull in West Africa, devastating to Sierra Leone, Guinea, Liberia, to our global economies. Uh, 30,000 people is a lot. Uh, in terms of mortality, but it's not it's not 500,000. And so why is this? Well, it turns out that we have an answer and we've had this answer for some time, which is that when we use the average number of secondary infections to project out to the final size of an epidemic, most of the theory that is commonplace in epidemiology and certainly on the front page of the newspapers now assumes that we can model the offspring distribution using a Poisson with lambda equal to the R naught. And so that we can really neglect the importance of super spreading events. We can neglect most of the importance of variability because the average uh, and the variance are equivalent under these assumptions. Foundational paper by Lloyd Smith et al, relaxing this assumption uh, that we can describe the dynamics of an epidemiological process using only the average and instead uses a negative binomial distribution to describe the offspring, the number of secondary infections for an epidemic process and comes up with much more realistic expectations about the way in which uh, these dynamics are, are going to play out. Now, for those of you that have not encountered the negative binomial distribution before, I will tell you that one of the rules for publishing on the negative binomial distribution seems that each new paper has to invent a new set of notation. And so I will often have to spend 30 minutes with Wikipedia and a bunch of conspiracy theory strings behind me trying to connect up the dots between whatever someone's notation is and the notation that I personally understand. Uh, but the way that I think about this is that there is a second parameter kappa that describes the importance of super spreading in this case. And let's not also get confused about the, about the fact that some ecologists would call over dispersion as being randomly distributed, where I would think of over dispersion as being super spreading, meaning there's clumping or clustering. But setting that aside, large values of kappa mean that the distribution of secondary infections or offspring gets closer and closer to Poisson. And as kappa goes to infinity, uh, it becomes Poisson with lambda equal to R naught. In practice, kappa is of about 10 are functionally infinity. So flu has a kappa of about 10. It basically acts like a mass action random mixing uh, with a Poisson distribution uh, of, of secondary infections and an R naught of two. As kappa gets closer and closer to zero, uh, it becomes increasingly dominated by rare super spreading events. So you can think about a disease like Ebola, it has an average of two, but that's because just about everybody infects zero other people and occasionally someone will infect 30, 40, 50 other people. And so the entirety of the dynamics of Ebola are driven by, to first approximation, that's weird, I'll say first approximation is the second moment, right? It's all about the variability. And so this plot from the Lloyd Smith et al. paper 
shows the proportion of infectious cases ranked on the x-axis based on the expected proportion of transmission events. So if we just think about this in a discrete time model where everybody that's infectious today will recover tomorrow, it's the proportion of infectious individuals infected today ranked by the proportion of infectious individuals that they infected when these infectious individuals become infectious tomorrow. And so this one-to-one -one line is a homogeneous population of Poisson models influenza. And as we see these lines bowing up and to the left, we have increasing importance of super spreading uh, all the way up to SARS, which is almost entirely dominated by, uh, by super spreading. And I can label this with Ebola and influenza. And so uh, most of the difference between Ebola infecting 30,000 people and being imminently controllable public health measures and flu marching along pretty deterministically until there's a vaccine has to do with the importance of super spreading uh, and, and the role of super spreading on the dynamics. Now, it turns out that COVID is actually sitting at kind of a sweet spot. It's just a little bit less reliant on super spreading than SARS and Ebola, probably a little bit more, or maybe about the same level of measles. And what that means from an applied public health perspective is that it can be controlled with aggressive, highly targeted interventions, even without a vaccine. But as soon as it gets a little bit out of control, it basically flips over from a stochastic regime into a deterministic regime, and it behaves more like influenza and really cannot be controlled without wholesale lockdowns uh, in the absence of a vaccine. So one of the reasons that I say that if the world understood uh, ecological theory a little bit better, I call it complex systems theory or, or complex networks, is that we can see right away, we had estimates of r and Kappa about this time last year almost, uh, that we could see right away that this tells us very, very quickly that this is a disease that is controllable, but only with rapid, aggressive, thoughtful, targeted uh, public health interventions. And very, very quickly, uh, we did some work that's now impressed at General Royal Society Interface, where we take the Lloyd Smith et al. framework and we extend it so that we can look at the effects of higher moments on the distribution of secondary infections. And so it turns out that in very interesting ways, uh, the effect of the kurtosis depends on the lower moments. And so as you go higher and higher and higher, you have this dependence on the final size, on the rate of spread, on the epidemic probability. Uh, we also look at the effect of stochasticity. So we use basically a branching process model to include stochasticity. And this turns out to be really important uh, because one of the things that happens with COVID, so I'll show you here, so this is the proportion of susceptible individuals infected uh, at time infinity in, in an infinite time model, infinite population model in this case. On the left are our estimates that include uh, the second moment, the variability in secondary infections. On the right uh, is an estimate that just uses the first moment. And the variability here is not from uncertainty. Uh, it's from different estimates of the r naught and Kappa that have been published in different papers. You see that there's really two different regimes here. And it turns out the regime on the left is largely dominated by stochastic dieouts early on. So about 60% of the time that COVID finds itself in a new population, the chain sputters out and dies before it actually is able to take hold. So the way you think about this is that COVID has to have an early super spreading event before it can flip over. And I'm, I'm obviously anthropomorphizing and massively simplifying what's going on here, but before it can flip over into the deterministic regime. So the difference here really has to do with some populations where either the population structure or the public health interventions were able to prevent COVID from exiting from this early stochastic phase and others on the right, that closed circle on the right is a fishing boat or it's a cruise ship or it's Manaus, where you basically end up with COVID sweeping through uh, the population. And so I'm just gonna layer up a bunch of other diseases here, uh, not with the hope of overwhelming you, but instead what I want everybody to just kind of squint at is look at the red bars, which are all over to the right here. And look at how for all these other pathogens where we're able to pull K kappas or r naughts out of the literature, smallpox, flu, flu, SARS, MERS, we've got a bunch of others in the paper, the red largely overlaps with the rest of them, meaning that, you know, it matters that we take into account the higher moments, and it really matters in some populations, but not like for COVID, where you get this big separation between what happens when we account for super spreading or over dispersion and what happens when we don't. And so it really does seem to be the case that COVID is sitting in this kind of special parameter space where small variability and what it experiences when it arrives in a population can lead to large organizational uh, differences uh, in terms of the outcome. And again, that's why I say that the kinds of eco-evolutionary dynamics that we're all studying are so important for bringing to bear on the COVID problem because these sort of dependence on spatial scales, in this case for COVID, it doesn't appear as though you can coarse grain away the effects of lower levels on the emergent properties, neither can you kind of uh, 
find like you have to account for the higher level properties as you go back down again. And these are the kinds of things that are a part of all of our training and understanding in many different uh, disciplines that we can bring to bear on COVID. So then very quickly, uh, it turns out that all of this is not even that simple. So if we want to say predict how long it's going to take for COVID to sweep through a population, we just can't use the first moment and second moment of the secondary infections. It turns out that the meta population structure that COVID finds itself in is also very important. And this has actually been one of my favorite pastimes of, of the recent kind of five years, is that it turns out that a lot of individuals that work on complex networks and a physics style approach uh, to epidemiological dynamics are rediscovering things that population geneticists uh, published uh, in the early to late 1990s, a lot of which having to do with metapopulation dynamics. And so there's this kind of interesting uh, rediscovery of some of the important things from population genetic theory around the funky things that metapopulation structure can do, can do to the dynamics of something that's spreading on the effects of infectious disease dynamics, and we're seeing them play out in real time uh, with COVID-19. So what do I mean? Well, if we have a nice closed population like this, the epidemic curve kind of looks like this. It's mostly symmetric. It's not totally symmetric, but it goes up and it comes back down. However, if we have this meta population structure where households are embedded in neighborhoods and we have complex processes that describe the ways in which individuals move between these households, we don't really know what these curves are going to look like. Important foundational theory from Duncan Watts et al. showed what some of these look like in a simulation model where you have a hierarchical organization. Four and I'm realizing I'm coming help. up on time here. Four minutes. You have a single wave in one population. And as you have increasing layers in the meta population, you get this bigger smear. And the smear is actually because of the stochasticity. You have N minus one waves uh, in a well-organized hierarchy where N is the number of layers. And very quickly, uh, and I'm just going to fly over this. This is maybe my favorite paper that was ever published by uh, Professor Lisa Satinspiel and Professor Deanne Herring, where they used logbook data from the Hudson Burr Fur Trading Company during the 1918 flu to show that 1918 flu behaves this way with respect to metapopulation dynamics, where you get these multi-wave outbreaks as a result of the metapopulation structure of the fur trading networks in, in what's now Northern Canada. All right, so I'm going to fast forward here. Uh, I'm going to skip over what I said in Twitter was going to be about uh, fundamental ecological theory, but it turns out that Lloyd's mean crowding uh, is a very strong predictor of the width and duration of COVID-19 epidemic curves over multiple orders of magnitude across countries from China to Italy all over the globe. So if you just take the human population distribution, you use that to calculate Lloyd's mean crowding, it is highly predictive of the shape and duration of COVID-19 curves globally, in particular that large urban areas like Sao Paulo, have these very long, broad epidemic curves as it bops around from deem to deem in the meta population that is Sao Paulo, whereas in Manaus, you get this quick SIR wave-like curve as it sweeps through this relatively well-connected uh, population. It also turns out that, and for those of you that haven't read this paper by uh, Wade et al., uh, they go through in great and very fascinating detail all the ways in which Lloyd's mean crowding is literally related to everything. But it turns out the nu numerator of Lloyd's mean crowding can be mapped onto the expected number of contacts in a network model, and there's a direct connection to the r naught, the epidemic threshold, the outbreak size. And so what we showed is in China and in Italy, uh, it's highly predictive of the intensity of, of these epidemic curves. And so what I'll do, we did this with some simulation models. Uh, it turns out if you want to flatten the curve, you have to decide whether you're in a meta population or not, because actually if you're in a meta population and you introduce a lockdown, you compress everybody into the households where the per contact probability of transmission is higher and you actually get an intensification of the curve, uh, whereas you only get the flattening if you're in a strict single layer meta population model. Um, and I'm going to skip over this. And with that, I will uh, thank again the organizers and I think I have a minute or so for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. So we're, we can take any questions if people have them. We have about a minute. Um, I, I have one. Uh, Samuel, when you were presenting, it, it's kind of like you're talking about like showing the different curves uh, for, you know, super spreader type curves versus homo homogeneous populations. Um, it's like you're talking about them as a necessary property of the diseases themselves, as opposed to the current society in which we find ourselves, where super spreading, it could be much more likely now because you have, 
you know, airplanes and big mass uh, events and things like that. So I was wondering to what extent it's a property of the disease itself versus the society structure that we now have. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I didn't mean to give that impression. If the, the longer version of this talk, it has a slide that says that the, these are properties of the pathogen and the system that it finds themselves in. It actually turns out with SARS, the misestimation of the pandemic risk, uh, which was published by Lauren Anselmeyer's, was because they took crowded apartment buildings and they extended those parameters to the rest of the global population, right? And unfortunately, this is still happening for, for COVID-19 is that really people don't understand as much as they should that the population structure matters as much or more uh, as, as the, the properties of the pathogen. Well, I, I think I took up the entire question time. I'm sorry about that. Um, we have to move on to the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Samuel. So uh, the next speaker is Orlando Schwery, who is going to talk to us about the right tool for the job. Is my phylogenetic diversification model adequate? Go for it, Orlando. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Orlando. Uh, thanks for showing up for my talk. Uh, this is some ongoing research from my current postdoc with Emma Goldberg uh, about um, model adequacy. Um, so the kind of models in question here, which we're trying to address the adequacy of, are um, models that are used to study lineage diversification. So real quick, what we want to do is we want to describe whether there are differences in the accumulation of species richness uh, and whether this, these differences vary in space or time or between lineages. And we also want to explain what causes those differences and whether maybe attributes of the environment or attributes of the organisms themselves uh, might have something to do with that. Uh, our weapon of choice here, as you might have realized already, are models that uh, allow us to estimate speciation and extinction rate dynamics. And we feed those with phylogeny and depending on the model also with um, other additional factors, for example, traits, which are thought to maybe affect those speciation and extinction rates. Now these um, models have been very popular and a lot of research has been done across the board addressing a lot of very interesting questions about what might be affecting diversification in different groups of organisms. But as we went along, it became, we became increasingly aware that there are different kinds of issues that affect these inferences. And if we do not, if we aren't aware of what those weaknesses are and we don't account for them somehow, uh, they could seriously affect our inference results. So what we, um, what we want to do, usually what we do is that we compare our models and we try to go for a model that has the best fit. But the problem is we don't know whether our best model is still a, actually a good model for our data to begin with. So what we need is a way to find out whether our model is adequate for our data, and that it's adequate to answer the question that we're after. And so therefore that's what we're setting up to do here, develop an adequacy test for those models. And hopefully use the result of this to be able to pinpoint what the reasons are why our model might not be adequate to have some kind of idea of what we need to do to improve. Now, real quick, I want to give you some kind of intuition about how model adequacy tests work. So let's assume we have some kind of pile of data here. And you can see those are numbers leading up to 12. So maybe you think my 12-sided die might be a great model for this. And of course, it will give you an answer, but this is an answer that you can rely on. Well, what we can do is we can roll this die many times and simulate data. and We'll find this like uniform distribution across all values. And then we could, for example, look at the distribution in the data and see that we actually have some kind of more of a bell-shaped kind of distribution. So clearly something is different here. Maybe upon reflection, one might get to the realization, oh, maybe we should actually use two six-sided dice and use those. And if we simulate under those, we might get to 
uh, a distribution that is much more similar than the distribution we have here in our data. So that is really kind of what we do when we do model adequacy. We know that data generated under different processes will have different properties. So essentially the data will look different. And by comparing whether the data under the model looks similar to our actual data, we will be able to judge how suitable the model is. Also, of course, because we rolled seven, the rover will come and steal half of our feeds, but uh, that is a story for a different day. So, of course, the idea of model adequacy tests is entirely new, and people have done similar things before, both for sub and nucleotide substitution models, for trade evolution, phylogenetic models, and even for simpler diversification models. Um, what we're employing here is what's called a posterior predictive simulation approach, a PPS. And what we're doing is essentially if we have an empirical tree that we try to study, and we have a model that we think would be useful for this, we will estimate model parameters for our data under this model in a Bayesian way, so we'll come out with a distribution of model parameters, for which, for example, will be estimations for speciation and extinction rate. Uh, now we will draw from these distributions to simulate a lot more trees under this model to get this like uh, distribution of different phylogenies uh, under this model, and we will measure what we call summary statistics. Uh, which are different properties of those trees that describe what those trees looks like, look like. And when we do this, we'll get these different distributions for each summary statistic that show us what most of our trees look like. And if we estimate this, uh, if we measure the same summary statistics for our empirical data as well, we can compare it to the simulated ones and we can see, for example, that some summary statistics will uh, the empirical data will fall outside of the simulated distribution, which would indicate that our model might be inadequate. Whereas if our empirical tree essentially looks the same as our simulated data, that would rather point towards it being adequate. So the actual big challenge here is of course, um, finding the summary statistics that show us the relevant differences, right? We wanna, we wanna figure out what really makes a difference here. Uh, and so we are using a lot of summary statistics right now, throw everything at it, um, that relates to a lot of um, aspects of phylogenies that we think are important here, like branch lines, topology, uh, trade phase, trade reconstruction. We're gonna try and figure out which ones of those are useful for us. Um, real quick, uh, to have a look at the kind of models that we're using, like our base models. So what we have here is that we have a, a constant rate model where we assume that there is a trait that has two different states, A and B, and we have uh, a speciation rate that will generate new lineages, and we have an extinction rate that will take lineages away. And uh, you can see in the constant rate model, we will actually not have a different rate between the two trait states. And so the trait does not affect uh, the diversification. Unlike for a state dependent model, the, uh, which is essentially the same, except that the rates are allowed to be different between the two trait states. So just to give you some kind of intuition, what that could mean for um, the trees, is that, for example, we could have a slow uh, diversifying green trade, green clade, and a faster diversifying purple clade. Now, slightly more involved, we have a, a state independent model where we can have our two traits. And we also have two different um, classes of diversification, but they're not actually dependent on uh, the trait, they're separate. So we might get a tree that looks very similar to this one here, where we also have two, like a, a slow and a fast clade, but they are actually referring to the 
it, like those internal rate classes and are not related to the trade. So going forward, I will refer to these as the constant model, the BC model, and the CID2 model, just for brevity. So if we simulate a lot of trees uh, under models that we know, so we know the answer, and then we run this procedure, we end up with something like this, where for every tree in the rows, we will end up uh, with a lot of um, summer statistics, which will either tell us, oh yeah, this kind of looks the same, or it will raise the red flag and say, oh, this looks kind of different. This might be an inadequate model. And for different pairs of model inference versus generating, we might get different patterns here. So what I'm essentially gonna do now is I'm gonna look for each tree, how many red flags do we have? And these will be the kind of plots that I'm gonna be using going forward, where on the x-axis we have the number of significant sum summaries that, that tell us, oh, this might be inadequate per tree. Now, so at first to see whether this is reliable, we're gonna look at the case where the generating model is the same as the inference model. So basically we're asking, are models adequate for themselves? Which hopefully they would be. And in fact, what we're finding is, yeah, there's some outliers and we will have to curate our set of summary statistics a little bit, but roughly we're finding what we're expecting. That they're all like close to zero, which would mean adequate. Now, what if we wanna run this for uh, the whole combination of those three models and what would we expect there? So if we wanna use the constant rate model on those trees simulated under those different models, of course, again, we would expect that the model is adequate for itself, but then we would expect that uh, for trees generated under a more uh, complex, complex model that the simple constant rate model would not be adequate and that would be somewhere out here. For the state dependent model, again, we would assume that it's adequate for itself. And since the constant rate model is nested within this, we would assume that it's also adequate to uh, describe those constant rate trees, but it would not be adequate for the state independent model, which is more complex. And then finally, we could maybe expect that our most involved model here is able to actually describe all of those trees uh, adequately. Now, what are we finding? Drum roll, success-ish. So we're actually doing quite okay, but there are a bunch of cases where we're off with our expectations. First off, it seems that constant rate models are adequate for uh, our complex trees under, uh, under a state independent uh, process, which shouldn't really be the case. The same for our state dependent model for those same trees. And finally, it seems that the state independent model is not adequate for our trade dependent trees. So what is going on here? Well, essentially, um, what I think is going on up here is that the summary statistics that we're currently using are not able to find the signature of uh, one versus two sets of rate categories in the trees. And uh, we really, we can only find those if they are linked to the traits and they were kind of highlighted by the traits. And I think we just need new summary statistics that allow us to do that. And we have some ideas on what we might be able to use there. Finally, down here, um, it turns out the state independent model is not actually nested in the state independent model. So if you have a, a trade dependent tree and you unleash the state independent model on it, well, it will actually give you the right answer in a way because it will possibly identify that the two rate categories are where the two um, traits are. But of course, if you simulate under this model, nothing in the model says that those should be aligning. So all the simulated trees will be all over the place. So in a way, this is actually a good thing because it allows us to distinguish between the same pattern versus the same process. So now what do we wanna raise the bar a little bit and come up with more complex scenarios? So our first two are some where we uh, have trade dependent diversification, but more. So for these two models here, we have uh, two different 
sets of speciation rates for uh, the two different trade states, but they are additionally also decreasing over time, in one case linearly, in one case exponentially. Um, and secondly, we have those BAM trees that are very messy trees where we draw um, rates from very different rate categories, like much more than two. And we have an independent, uh, a neutral trait simulated over it. So the trait state should have nothing to do with the diversification rate. The reason we use those is because uh, Robotic and Goldberg have found for, for those very trees that trait dependent models are very likely to falsely claim that there is trait dependent speciation going on here. So, again, what we do expect, we would of course expect the model to be. Uh, adequate for itself. And then we would assume that the more we go away from a pure trade dependence, the more inadequate we're, we're getting. So more for linear, more for exponential time dependence. And then for the batteries, we should be far out. Again, what are we finding? Well, kind of. So we can't really tell apart the linear time dependent uh, trees from the pure trade dependent ones. We not really, but we kind of see hints for the exponential ones. But for the BAM trees, for the complex trees, we can actually, we're doing a pretty good job telling those apart. So what does that mean? First of all, this is kind of a success because remember, those are the trees where- You have four minutes, comes... Orlando. You have four minutes, Orlando. Thank you. Uh, those are the trees where the model comes up with the wrong answer a lot. So now we're able to, find those wrong answers, which is a good thing, I would say. Now, two things that are going on here. First off, one thing might be that we're getting to the limits of the approach, and maybe those trees are just not different enough from trees generated under uh, the actual trade dependent model that we could tell the difference. And secondly, if you think about it, um, the model tells us that there is trade dependent diversification going on. And if you remember those models, well, there is. There's just not only that going on. So maybe if we explore the summary statistics a bit more, we might be able to tell um, whether there, we have adequacy for the model can describe our data exactly. And maybe we have adequacy for, uh, we can get the right answer out for our question. So this is a very, to me, a very exciting thing to look into going forward. Just real quickly, so we can kind of uh, tell models apart, we can detect uh, some of the false positive inferences. We will definitely have to do some more sensitivity testing and some more um, development on the summary statistics to be better able to find what the actual reasons for modeling adequacy are. Uh, but eventually, hopefully, this is going to be a practical tool for people to be able to identify which models they should use, and maybe also which models they should use as a null hypothesis, so they're not comparing their models against an alternative that is clearly off the charts anyway. So I'd like to thank uh, a bunch of people, of course, uh, my advisor and the lab, uh, my current host lab and uh, in Idaho, and people who have already moved on since then. Uh, Bunch of people who have provided input at the Los National Lab and people back uh, in Tennessee. And leaving you with this meme that actually just came up yesterday at SIGBee about this problem. Um, I would thank you all for listening and be ready for any of your questions. It's a great meme. All right, so I, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. I, I was curious to know whether you run into any situations where you kind of get a circularity where your parameters that you use to model your expected distributions kind of circle back, if that makes sense. Mm. Let me think if I'm entirely sure what you mean by that. Um, because the we're not actually modeling the, the summary statistics that describe yeah. what the shape of the tree of the trees is. So 
obviously they will be affected by it, but hopefully, I mean, hopefully they will be affected by it because if they're not different between the different models, then we can't say anything. Um, but I think there shouldn't be any circularity otherwise, because we're not actually uh, simulating the three shapes uh, targetedly. But uh, yeah, let me know if, not, if that doesn't really answer. No, that question. makes sense, yeah. I didn't think that there would be, but I was curious to know if you, if you ran into that situation. We did have moments where we thought about this a little bit because it could sometimes seem like it, but I think we're safe there. Uh, I think that's the end of our time. Thank you very much, Orlando. Thank you. So the next talk uh, will be by Kawang Yiju, and it's about evolutionary rescue under demographic and environmental stochasticity. Kawang Yiju, you're uh, muted. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Kwang Yi from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and my talk is on the demographic and under demographic and environmental capacity. Uh, so, demographic is a framework for studying adaptation, which combines both evolution and ecology. So, people mainly consider uh, a population that recovers from an initial demographic decline through genetic evolution after environmental change. And here are some examples of evolution rescue in the wild. So to illustrate, uh, I will take the moss population as an example. So in this figure, the y-axis is population size and the x-axis is the generation. And before the industrial pollution, most moths are white. But after industrial pollution, the white moths will be selected against and population size will decline. But in the meanwhile, the black moths will be favored and increase in frequency. And after some time, the population may rebound to the original uh, population size and most moths will be black. But when population size is very low, uh, fluctuation of the population size may lead population to go extinct. Therefore, it's the stochasticity of the population size that directly causes population to extinct. But there are two types of stochasticity. Uh, one is demographic stochasticity, which is due to a sampling error in individual's offspring number. Uh, for example, some mother may have a single baby, but some mother may, born, uh, may have twins or even triplets. The other major type of stochastic is environmental stochasticity, which is due to the temp temporal fluctuation and mean fitness. Uh, for example, for the plant population, the reproductive output of the seeds will depend on the temporal fluctuation of pollinator surveys, which is influenced by the weather or uh, rainfall. And since the population survival rate will depend on its demographic dynamics, there are two major factors that influence this dynamics. The one is the selection intensity. So a stronger selection will cause the population to evolve fast, faster, but also will cause more selective deaths if it's a hard selection and make the population to initially decline more severely. So if we can draw a plot for the survival probability change with time, a stronger selection may cause lower survival rate initially over the short term compared to a weak selection, but cause a higher survival rate uh, over the longer term. The other factor is genetic variance. Similarly, genetic variance will increase the evolution rate, but also impose the business cost under stable lightning selection. And for the, survive, uh, for the survival probability that change with time, a higher genetic variance may, have, may lead to a higher survival rate over the shorter term and a lower survival rate over the longer term. So based on this previous analysis, we mainly asked three questions. The first question is that how the select intensity influence population survival rate and, sec and, and how these facts uh, differ under demographic and environmental stochasticity. The second question is that the effects of genetic variance and how it differs under the two types of stochasticity. And for the third question, uh, I, I, I'm interested in knowing the factors that 
are crucial for population survive under demographic versus environmental stochasticity? Is it due to an initial higher genetic variance or initial higher fitness or an initial larger population size that makes population to survive over the whole everything rescue process? So to answer these questions, I mainly consider the context of phenotypic selection. So in, in these two panels, the x-axis is phenotypic value. And the, in the upper panel, the y-axis is the fitness. So you can see that there is an optimum level of phenotypic value that gives the highest fitness. And, uh, and the omega would denote the strength of selection. And correspondingly, the population will always have a frequency distribution of the phenotypic value with a phenotypic variance of sigma p squared. And after the environmental change, the phenotypic optimum will shift from d0 to d0 plus d0, which drives the population to evolve to a higher phenotypic value. So based on this setup, we can write out how the fitness change with time and I also assume that the phenotypic and genetic variance is constant during the evolution as many previous models did. But later I would do individual phase simulation to relax this assumption. So based on the previous model, we can write out the uh, stochastic differential equation for population size change. And the determinist part is representing the first term in these two equations and M is the mean fitness of the population. And the second term in these equations are the noise due to stochasticity. And the key difference of demographic and environmental stochasticity is that the noise term would depend differently on the population size. So here's the result. Uh, first for the selection intensity on population survival probability. We find that a higher selection intensity will always cause lower survival rate. So in this figure, the y-axis is the survival probability and the x-axis is, is selection intensity. You can see that uh, the, the survival probability just declined more tunically with, with the selection intensity. But more importantly, there uh, under different selection intensity, population will have different demographic modes. Uh, so for example, in region one, where selection intensity is low, the population will, will increase with time uh, if there's no noise. When selection intensity is intermediate in region two, we return back to the classical U-shaped demographic curve in which population first decrease and then increase with time. And in region three, when selection is very strong, the population will decl always decline with time. And from an empirical perspective, to detect the selection, uh, to detect the effects of selection intensity, the key is that we need that the survival probability that change with selection intensity, which is in this region, because in this region all select survival probability is one, and it cannot detect any effects of selection intensity. But when the environmental shift is very small. Most of these differential survival probably happen in the third region, in region three, where population size will always dec decline with time. And it's only when the amount shift is large that most of the differential survival probably happens in region two, which is the U-shaped curve. This result indicates that uh, the emission rescue should not be restricted to, under, rest restrict to a U-shaped demographic curve, but should be considered in all the demogra demographic modes. And furthermore, we also find that under environmental stochasticity, the differential survival probability, probability will happen at uh, the whole range of selection intensity, and which, is, which means uh, all the demogra demographic modes. And for the effects of, of genetic variance on population survival rate, to compare, to compare between different populations, we assume that population will have the same environmental variance so that we can use heritability as an indicator of the level of genetic variance. And here we plot the survival probability that change with time. So the y-axis is population that have different level of heritability, which is different level of genetic variance. 
and the x axis is generation. And the color represents the survival probability. And we find that there exists an optimal level of heritability, which gives the highest survival probability. But this level will change with time. When the environment shift is rapidly low, this optimal level of heritability will increase time as a white line shows. But when the environment shift is large, this optimal level of heritability dec decrease, decrease with time, which means that a higher initial genetic variance will give a higher survival probability over the shorter term due to a quicker evolution, but the rapidly lower genetic variance will give higher survival probability over the longer term due to a lower fitness load. And to answer the third question of the key factors that cause population survive under the two types of stochasticity, uh, I, I, I track the genetic and demographic parameters of replic populations from simulations. And here is a typical figure that I will show later. And in this figure, the y-axis is genetic variance and the x-axis is generation. And the theories of the orange and yellow lines are the replica population that uh, finally survive. And the gray, theories of gray lines are those that go extinction. And I calculate the average of the, the average from the survival and extinction group, which is depicted by the uh, bold red and bold black lines. So under demographic stochasticity, we find that the key factor that makes population to survive is that the survival group will have a much higher initial genetic variance than the extinction group as you can see from the last panel. And this higher initial genetic variance can be due to two factors. The first is stochastic in genetics, which is drift. And the second factor is because the survival group will have a slightly higher uh, population size than the extinction group due to demographic stochasticity. And in the right panel, it shows that uh, the survival group has higher initial population size than extin extinction group. But it's hard to disentangle between these two contributions because they mutually facilitate each other. So a uh, higher genetic variance will cause population to evolve faster, so, which means a higher initial population size. And a higher population size will also make the means a higher population size also means the drift is weaker, so which leads to a higher genetic variance. But under environmental stochasticity, we find that the key difference between the two groups are that the survival group will have a much higher initial mean growth rate than the extinction group. Uh, it's, it is shown in the middle panel. And the genetic variance and genetic variance between the two groups are not quite different as that under demographic stochasticity. And the black and the blue dashed lines are the predictions from the model without stochasticity. So the survival group will also have a higher initial growth rate than the uh, deterministic predictions. So as a conclusion, uh, in this study, we first investigate in fact we, we first first investigate the effects of selection intensity. We find that stronger selection always cause higher extinction. And but under demographic stochasticity, differential survival rates can happen at different demographic modes, which depends on both the level of the environmental change and the intensity of selection. And under environmental stochasticity, differential survival rate can happen at all, all, all the demographic modes. And for the effects of genetic variance, we find that there is exists an optimum level of genetic variance, which, which gives the highest probability. And this optimal level of genetic variance will increase the time when the shift is small, but decreases with time when the shift is large. And we further find that this optimal level of genetic variance will not differ on the demographic and environmental stochasticity, which means that 
the types of stochastic does not affect the effects of genetic variance on survival. And at last, for the key factor that cause the population to survive, we find that under demographic stochasticity, a high initial genetic variance and population size is key for population to survive over the entry rescue process. But under the environmental stochasticity, a high initial fitness is uh, crucial for survival. And I want to thank the peers uh, and faculty members from UNC for their beneficial comments and suggestions. And thanks for watching, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you. That was, that was awesome. Uh, we have a question from Andrew Hendry. Which range of parameter space for genetic variants is closest to empirical best, uh, to empirical best estimates of actual additive genetic variants in fitness? I think I can, uh, but I don't know the answer because, uh, so, so what I do for the genetic variants is that, the, is that I, I control the mutation pressure. So the genetic variance will depend on the mutate, how large the mutation pressure is and how many low size the trait is controlled. So, and yes. So because I'm a theorist, I, I think I don't quite know the empirical uh, literature on um, the actual value of genetic variance. Yeah. Um, we also have a question. How were the optimal genetic variance values calculated? Uh, so for this, uh, for the, for the, uh, Demogra demographic stochasticity based on this stochastic differential equation, you can directly write out the uh, an expression for survival probability, and you can derive the survival probability with genetic variance. When the first derivative is zero, you can get the highest uh, genetic variance that uh, you can get the optimal genetic variance that gives the highest probability. But for the environmental stochastic, you cannot write out the survival rate. So I use uh, numerical simulations and I just increase the genetic variance by a very small step and find the uh, optimal level of environmental stochastic, uh, optimal genetic variance under environmental stochasticity. So in a related question, uh, can the model incorporate both demographic and environmental stochasticity? Uh, yes. So to incorporate both, you can just add a third terms uh, for the noise term, just combine these two terms. And actually in, uh, in the real population, a population will have both the demographic and environmental stochasticity, but the relative proportion of the two types of stochasticity will differ. And uh, when there are both stochasticity, the uh, in simulation you will find that it will be an intermediate between both. Like when there's only demographic stochasticity, a high genetic initial genetic variance is key for survival. But when you add environmental stochasticity, then both a higher genetic variance and a high initial growth rate will be key for survival. But their importance will depend on the proportion of demographic and environmental stochasticity. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, did you consider competition among species in this framework and with differential genetic variances? Uh, no, I, I, I consider just one, one population, so there's no competition. And then um, how did you track the evolutionary dynamics of the species? Uh, so for simulations, I just track the, calculate the genetic variance, uh, mean fitness, and, pop, and, and record the population size uh, every generation. 
so, so that I can track the genetic and demographic parameters. Yeah, so but for model, uh, you can directly write out the dynamic equation so you can know the fitness and survival probability. Cool, thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Kwangji. Uh, now we're going to go to a pre-recorded talk uh, by one of our European colleagues, Matt Barber. Well, currently European. Uh, and so we'll play that. Uh, Matt doesn't appear to be here, but if one of his co-authors is, of course you can speak up and uh, maybe we'll have some questions for you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and play that video now. This is Mott Barber talking about a keystone gene underlies the persistence of a food web. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Barber. I'm a postdoc at the University of Zurich and I'm also an associate editor at the Journal of Animal Ecology. And today I'm gonna to share with you some work that I've done in collaboration with Dan Klibenstein and Jordi Bascompte that looks at the role of genetic variation within species in shaping community stability. So one of the grand challenges that I feel we face today as ecologists is in understanding how biological processes scale from genes all the way up to complex ecosystems. And over the past 30 years, we've seen some fantastic examples of these cross-scale linkages much of this body of work was nicely summarized by Andrew Hendry in his book on eco-evolutionary dynamics. Now, while this framework has produced some fantastic examples demonstrating these linkages, I think that it actually hinders our ability to not only understand, but predict how these biological processes scale. And that's because, at least especially at the community level, studies often treat a community as a collection of species that can be well described by its richness or composition. But we know, but what we know is that a community is far from a collection of species, but that it's structured by interactions between species. And it's the strength and organization of these interactions that determine its dynamics. And so one of my favorite examples of this comes from Bob Payne's classic experiment, where he showed that removing sea stars from an intertidal food web altered the structure of feeding interactions, resulting in just a few species outcompeting others for limited space in the intertidal. And so this experiment showed that sea stars act as keystone species in that they determine the structure and stability of this ecological community. And so rather, than, rather than approaching the problem like this, what I think we need is a more explicit view of how genetic variation within species structures interactions in a community context. So this is an experimental food web that I've developed at the University of, of Zurich. Each, each circle corresponds to a population of a different species and the DNA ring represents the fact that there's genetic and phenotypic variation within these populations with two arrows between, with arrows between species representing the interaction, solid arrows are positive effects and dashed arrows are negative ones. And so what I hope this diagram makes clear is that any property of a community, such as its richness or composition, emerge from this network of interactions between species. And so what we need is a more explicit view of how genetic variation shapes interactions between species in a community context. And so for the rest of my talk today, I'm going to show you how I've been using the experimental approach to understand how genetic variation within species scales up to sh uh, shape the structure and stability of a food web. And to do this, I've been using the experimental food web, which is a subset of the one that I showed you earlier. At the base of this food web is Arabidopsis thaliana, and it's fed upon by two different species of aphids that are in turn attacked by a parasitic wasp. Now this food web is naturally associated with Arabidopsis in nature, one of the reasons why I decided to use Arabidopsis is because we have a lot of information about the genotype to phenotype um, map in this species. In other words, how genetic variation shapes ecologically important phenotypes. And one of the phenotypes that we suspect is important in this system is the, um, is the secondary metabolites Arabidopsis produces called glucosinolates. Now you may not be familiar with these compounds, but I'm sure you've tasted them. Uh, they, it's what gives cabbage and Brussels sprouts their bitter taste and also that spicy flavor to mustard and wasabi. One of the fortunate things is that the genotype to phenotype map of these glucosinolates 
is, has been rather char well characterized. And so this is a simplified schematic of what this, uh, what the biosynthetic pathway looks like for these glucosinolate compounds. So as you can see, there's three key genes, MAM1, AOP2, and JSOH, that determine much of the qualitative variation in these chemical phenotypes. And so what I did is I leveraged existing natural accessions and transgenic lines that knock out um, these key genes along this biosynthetic pathway to determine much of the qualitative variation that we see in, um, in this Arabidopsis uh, chemical diversity that we actually see in nature. And so by using these different genotypes, I can isolate the effects of allelic differences at each one of these genes on interactions in the community. And so what I did using these four different genotypes, I created experimental plant populations that either had just one, two, or four different genotypes. And by creating this gradient of genetic diversity, this allowed me to not only test the effects of specific alleles at each one of these genes, but also more general effects of genetic diversity on these species interactions. And so I grew these plants for four weeks in the greenhouse before adding the experimental food web. So here's a short little video of me adding the aphids to this food web. I did two adult uh, aphids of each one of the species to each of these pots. And what this allowed, and then I allowed these aphid populations to grow for two weeks before adding the uh, parasitoid wasp. And so you can see I'm just adding the final aphid to this pot before I add it to this experimental cage, which is where we're going to be tracking the population dynamics of this of these experimental food webs over time. And so here's just a video of one of the 60 cages, um, experimental cages that we created. And so together we had 60 experimental food webs across two, two different climate chambers. And one of, the reason, one of the reasons we took advantage of these different climate chambers was to simulate how the effects of warming might alter the effects of uh, specific alleles and genetic diversity on, on the food web. And so in one of the chambers, we kept at 20 degrees Celsius, which reflects the daily mean temperature during the summer in this part of Switzerland. And it, the other chamber we held at 23 degrees Celsius to represent the warming we expect these insects to experience in the next 25 to 50 years. Now, just to let you know, the, for the, my results, I'm just going to focus on the genetic effects. Importantly, that they were robust to this experimental warming, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about um, the effects of warming later. And so every week, we would take out the cages and we'd count the abundance of aphids as well as the parasitoids. And so for the parasitoids, we would count the adult individuals that are flying around the cage. And we'd also look for these mummies, which you can uh, see are these, these little brown shells. And that's what the adult aph or parasitoids turn the aphids into before they emerge. And then we repeated this procedure for four months, tracking the population dynamics of all three species. And so for the first series of results that I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on food web persistence. And this is, so we're gonna look at how genetic variation and specific uh, alleles at each of these genes affect food web persistence, which is the proportion of spe species surviving until the end of the experiment. And so in this graph here, each of the gray circles corresponds to the average uh, food web persistence for a particular genetic composition, which we have 11 in total. And what you can see is that with increasing the number of genotypes in the plant population, increasing genetic diversity, it increased food web persistence. And for every genotype, it increased food web persistence by as much as 38%. But we're also interested in the effects of uh, specific genes. And so in this graph here, the dotted line represents the effect of the average allele on food web persistence after we control for the effects of genetic diversity. So what you can see here is that for MAM1 and JSOH, different alleles at each one of these genes has typical effects on food web persistence. In other words, it doesn't seem to differ from the average effects. 
But in contrast, AOP2, depending on which allele is in the plant population, it has a strong effect on food web persistence. And in particular, if we add a null AOP2 allele to the plant population, it increased food web persistence by as much as 28%. So analogous to Bob Payne's experiment, where he showed that sea stars function as a keystone species, what we see is that AOP2 appears to function as a keystone gene in this food web, in that depending on which allele is present in the population, determines the stability of, this, of its associated food web. So this is an interesting result, but right now, we don't really know exactly how AOP2 is affecting the food web. So to kind of dive into this a bit more, I looked at critical transitions in the food web over time. So a critical transition refers to a local extinction that simplifies the food web. And this diagram on the right um, shows you all the critical transitions that we observed in this experiment. And so I looked at the effects of AOP2 on each one of these critical transitions. And so in this graph here, this shows you the effects of adding a functional AOP2 allele on the, risk, uh, on the risk of each one of these critical transitions, okay? And the main thing I want you to see here is that all of these arrows between the critical transitions is that they're all gray, which means that there were statistically unclear effects or non-significant effects. But instead, when we add a functional AOP2 allele to the population, we see that it alters the risk of a critical transition in the dominant food chain with just the aphid and one, or with just one of the aphids in the parasitoid. And it reduces the risk of this food chain collapsing to, um, so that there are no insects by 66%. Okay, so now we've identified where AOP2 is acting in the food web but we still don't know, okay, how exactly is it promoting food web persistence? So to do this, I leveraged theory on the structural stability of ecological communities. And the reason I did that is because depending on, if we have information on how species are interaction, interacting, as well as their intrinsic growth rates, this enables me to make predictions for whether the system will persist or not. And so I use my, uh, the data we had on the population dynamics of all the interacting species, to estimate the strength of these interactions as well as the intrinsic growth rates. And so in this next graph, on the x-axis, we have the intrinsic growth rate of the aphid, and on the y-axis, we have the intrinsic growth rate of the parasitoid. The gray area represents the range of intrinsic growth rates that are compatible with the aphid and parasitoid coexisting. And this gray area is determined by the interactions between the aphid and the parasitoid. And so what you can see here is that AOP2, rather than altering uh, this gray area, it increases the intrinsic growth rates of the aphid and the parasitoid, okay, which are denoted by this arrow. And so if there's a null AOP2 allele in the plant population, it in increases the intrinsic growth rates of the aphid and parasitoid and moves it into the region where they're both able to coexist, okay, compared to if there's only a functional AOP2 allele in the population. And so this what is what appears to be uh, this positive effect on aphid and parasitoid intrinsic growth rates is, appears to be what's underlying the persistence of this food chain. And now for AOP2, what we think is underlying its effects on the aphid and the parasitoid is simply an effect of AOP2 on plant growth rates. So these are the results from an additional experiment, except we didn't add any insects and we did it over a much shorter time scale. But otherwise, everything was the exact same as before. And what you can see is that adding a null AOP2 allele to the plant population had a strong effect on plant growth rates. And we think that this pleiotropic effect of AOP2 on plant growth is what's underlying these positive effects on aphid and parasitoid intrinsic growth rates. So to wrap up here, what we're seeing is that genetic diversity within the plant increases food web persistence, and that this is determined by a single allele and a single gene that increase the intrinsic growth rates of species across multiple trophic levels. And importantly, these effects were robust to a three degrees um, increase in warming. Now, one of the, I think, 
dire implications of this result is that if there is a keystone gene in um, a natural population, and given that the fact that we're losing, losing genetic diversity at an alarming rate, that this could actually cause abrupt and catastrophic shifts in the functioning and persistence of ecosystems. Okay, makes them, and potentially they're much more susceptible than we currently realize. But I also think that there's some more hopeful implications. For example, we could leverage this information on how genetic variation shapes the structure and stability of the food web to uh, leverage this in assisted migration where we are not only interested in optimizing or promoting the persistence of species in future climates, but also fostering biodiversity in these future climates. And we could even think about how this, uh, this general approach could be used for, uh, for breeding novel plants that optimize both crop yield and biodiversity if we want to create more sustainable agricultural systems. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much. Okay, I think that uh, Matt is not here to answer questions, which is quite reasonable, of course, because I think it's uh, 2 a.m. where he is, and also um, his co-authors co are there as well. So you'll just have to shoot him an email, check out his paper on BioArchive, and uh, I'm sure he'd love to have the feedback. And in the meantime, we have a few minutes before the last talk, which will be by my colleague, Anna Hargreaves. Uh, and uh, Mike will have an announcement here, I think, uh, to help us with that, that time. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, we have an unplanned uh, event on the schedule that we've just set up. And I, I put it in the uh, chat for everybody a while ago. Um, but we, we set up a, an extra Zoom session that'll start immediately after this uh, uh, contribute a paper session and we'll go just for just under an hour and we'll stop right at six so we don't uh, uh, get a, in don't clash with the trivia thing tonight but for about an hour we'll have a zoom room set up where which is kind of a virtual uh, social uh, bring a, a polar bear butt uh, like Andrew has there and um, uh, just hang out uh, we'll Probably we'll set up some breakout rooms so we can have the option of moving into smaller rooms if there's enough people that want to do that. Uh, but uh, sorry for the last minute notice, but uh, it's one of the suggestions that came through today is that it'd be nice to have more social time. So we're, we're trying to do that. Uh, the second announcement is the uh, it's too late if you haven't signed up before, but if you have, of course, remember that the natural history trivia run by the ASN uh, grad students is tonight. And uh, that's um, going to be awesome as it always is, I'm sure. And then I actually think Anna had an announcement she wanted to make uh, about the, um, well, she'll tell you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so this year I am heading the committee for the ASN Student Research Awards. And um, usually they're due January 31st at the end of the month, but because it's been such a wild start to 2021, we thought that uh, we would extend the deadline by a week. So um, if you're a student and you're planning to submit an application, uh, definitely do it, um, and, but you have an extra week to do it. And so if you're a PI, um, just let your students know. I think we're gonna announce it officially tomorrow um, and the website should be up to date tomorrow as well. And Judy uh, commented in the chat, I just passed, pasted it there too, that she just signed up for the trivia night. So as a, as a president elect, she may have got special treatment, who knows, but um, uh, she said she just signed up for the trivia night. So it may be possible to still, to still sign up. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in that and haven't signed up, check it out. And Kelsey, speaking of the graduate student council, there's the store and you can buy merch. I received my shirt today. So there's lots of nice designs. So uh, it's on Redbubble, I think, and the link got sent out a few times. Uh, and I think the funds go towards supporting initiatives by the graduate student council. Is that right? So to support diversity initiatives, I think they uh, right. allocated yeah, so it towards. Yeah. Get a nice shirt and support in diversity initiatives. It seemed like a win-win. Uh, Kelsey tells us that they're accepting everyone. So uh, uh, for the trivia, right back to that. Um, so you're, it's still possible, I think. And since we probably don't have like a, a, a final wrap-up session, um, it's a good opportunity for me to remind everybody 
uh, that membership in ASN uh, affords many benefits, uh, both just from a social perspective, but also in interaction and networking. And it's extremely cheap, particularly for graduate students. So I strongly encourage graduate students to sign up for it. Um, back in the day when I was younger, I got I purchased a lifetime uh, membership, uh, which will pay itself off, I think, in about 18 years. So if you plan on being in the business for a while, it's a great way to not have to worry about to renew your subscription. So uh, the younger you are, the, the quicker you can get, uh, you can get your money back. Okay. Um, are there any more other quick announcements? Okay. So we're going to go uh, straight into a talk by uh, Anna Hargraves from McGill University, my colleague, and she will be speaking to us about geographical patterns and the importance of biotic interactions. Anna. Okay, so everything is showing up as it should. Great. Okay, thanks everyone so much for coming uh, to this very, very last talk in what has been a really wonderful conference. Um, I don't know about you, but I really welcomed a change from the news cycle of the last week. It's been really nice to think about science instead of uh, everything else. So today, instead of telling you, um, I'm just gonna see if I can move this, there we go. Instead of telling you about several results from one study, I want to share with you uh, one result from each of three studies that each touch on this question of whether there are predictable geographic patterns and the importance of species interactions. Okay, so we know that interactions between species can be powerful ecological and evolutionary forces. We know that they can drive population dynamics um, and population cycles. We know that they can strongly affect individual fitness and that by doing so, they can select on the traits that are involved in interactions. Uh, we know that when there's spatial variation in interactions, this selection can lead to local adaptation where organisms adapt to um, their local biotic environment and we know that this local adaptation can in fact eventually lead to speciation. So one of the world's most famous examples of adaptive radiation is driven by a biotic interaction of food availability. And finally, we know that uh, interactions can also scale up to define species distributions. So the example here is from Momagansik in Quebec, where seed predation was the single most important factor determining the range uh, limit of sugar maples. So there's no question that interactions can be really important, but incorporating them into a systematic understanding of spatial patterns in ecology and evolution has been tricky. So if I or you uh, want to see how some abiotic feature of the environment relates to whatever it is we study, uh, you can download um, really fine scale, long-term, incredible data on abiotic variables uh, in a matter of minutes. And um, this is because for abiotic variables, we measure them in standardized units. We often have standardized equipment and ways of measuring them. And we increasingly do this at uh, huge, sometimes global scales. And there's just no equivalent for systematically measuring the strength or importance of biotic interactions. Uh, in fact, you know, as a community, we would be pretty stoked if we could even just map where individual species occur in the world. Uh, and we're not even quite yet, there yet, let alone trying to map their interactions. So while we have lots of compelling case studies that illustrate that interactions can be really important, we have less predictive ability of when they're important. Uh, in other words, we also don't know when we need to go out and collect the data on interactions to inform our um, ecological and evolutionary predictions. So this leads to this question um, that I have been thinking about on and off for about uh, 10 years at least. And I know that many of you um, in the audience think about it as well. And like any good question in ecology and evolution, we are not the first people to be intrigued by it. So Dub Shansky in a famous paper called Evolution in the Tropics proposed among other things that species interactions are more intense towards low latitudes, so in tropical ecosystems, and therefore more evolutionarily important in the tropics. In a similar vein, 
Darwin, in no less than the origin of species, proposed that species interactions are more intense both towards low latitudes, but also towards low elevations. And that they therefore uh, are more likely to limit the low latitude and low elevation edge of a species distribution. So two uh, seminal thinkers among others who have predicted that interactions are predictably more important at um, tropics and lowlands. So I'm going to tell you about three vignettes. Um, each of these is a separate study, a different data set, and I'm going to present you one result from each that touches on this question. So first, from an ecological perspective, uh, we're, we will test whether interaction strength does in fact become stronger towards the tropics and um, towards low elevations. Second, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, we'll look at how often interactions drive local adaptation and whether um, in line with Dobshansky's prediction, they drive local adaptation more often in the tropics than in the temperate zone. And finally, from a biogeographic perspective, we will uh, look at how often biotic interactions influence species distributions and test Darwin's predictions that they should do this more often at the low latitude and low elevation edge of species ranges. So the first study I'm going to tell you about is a standardized experiment. And what's different um, between this and the other two things is that here we actually collected the data in the field ourselves. So the interaction that we used is seed predation. Seed predation is a great interaction for this purpose because it has really strong fitness and demographic consequences for plants. And also because seeds are stable, so you can uh, ship them around. Although it turns out this is actually not as easy as I first thought it was when I set up this experiment. But if you persevere, you can in fact ship seeds internationally, which means that you can use the same biological material at all of your experimental sites. So uh, the experiment that we did was really simple. We would go to a site and we would set up 30 depots of seeds using one of these two agricultural species. And then we just come back in 24 hours and see how many have been eaten or removed. The trick is replicating the experiment at the biogeographic scale that's relevant to this hypothesis. So every triangle that you can see in this map shows you one mountain where we ran the experiment in a uh, transect of site spanning uh, 800 to 2000 meters of elevation. And so this enables us to disentangle the effects of latitude and, um, and elevation. One does not do this type of experiment alone. And I worked with a really fantastic group of collaborators from seven countries um, and many invaluable field assistants to pull this off. So the first result that I want to show you is just um, to highlight the uh, large amount of variation in the final data set. So here I'm just showing you spatial uh, variation. We also had temporal variation um, as we repeated the experiment at different mountains. Each line in this messy figure shows you the elevational pattern at one of those mountains. And the take home message I want you to get from this slide is that there's no point testing for global patterns at local scales. Um, at the local scale, there's just way too much variation. And so you really need to be testing these patterns at the appropriate scale. Um, and because we had such a good spread of data, we were able to sort of pierce through this variation and find that there was actually a really consistent pattern that supported the prediction um, that seed predation was strongest in the tropics. So this is low latitudes and decreased towards high latitudes up in the Arctic. Uh, this was true whether we measured total seed predation here or predation just by invertebrates. And the effect size is about 18%. So you as a seed are 18% more likely to be eaten uh, in, uh, in one day in the tropics than you are in the Arctic. And I'm not showing you the data, but we actually found the same effect size for elevation. So um, an 18% decrease in seed predation from sea level to high elevations. At the time that we started this experiment, it was the most ambitious um, test for gradients in interaction strength. And, uh, and we got a really robust signal that interactions, at least seed predation, is stronger at low latitudes and elevations as predicted. And there have been a few studies that have come out um, in the meantime 
also running really big standardized tests of this uh, hypothesis. And so far, the data generally support it in at least terrestrial ecosystems, at least for consumption type interactions. So the next study I'm going to tell you about um, is uh, looking at local adaptation. So for this study, um, we did a meta-analysis of common garden experiments. Um, to refresh your memory, uh, local adaptation is the idea that if you have spatial variation in the environment, under the right circumstances, populations will adapt to uh, increase their fitness in their local environment. And the prediction is that if you then move individuals from different populations to a common environment, you expect the local genotype to outcompete the foreign genotypes. Uh, and we have uh, decades of this type of common garden experiment, but of course, um, everybody does this experiment in slightly different ways. So some people will do their common garden experiment in a completely natural setting. And these studies are really testing for local adaptation to the full suite of abiotic and biotic factors that, um, that individuals experience. But it's also really common for researchers to alter the environment for their transplants in a way that um, usually increases transplant performance, uh, but in a way that often reduces biotic interactions. So for example, if I was going to set up a seed transplant, I might clear away all the local vegetation first, um, which would reduce competition. So if biotic interactions are commonly the thing that's driving local adaptation, then we should expect to find a stronger signal of local adaptation in these studies that leave interactions intact and a weaker signal of local adaptation in these studies that remove some of those interactions. So in this meta-analysis, uh, we did way more than I'm gonna tell you about here. Um, we did look at the strength of local adaptation as well. I'm just gonna tell you about our data on the frequency of local adaptation. So um, we deemed local adaptation to be found as long as the local genotype outperformed the foreign genotypes. And to test Dobshansky's prediction, uh, we divided the data for this analysis into data from temperate zones uh, or the temperate zone and um, data from the tropics. So first we'll look at the temperate data. This made up more than 90% of the data in our data set. Uh, and we find that when experiments are done in natural settings, we see a strong signal of local um, adaptation. So local adaptation is detected in uh, more than 50% of the times that we test for it. And so of course our prediction if interactions are important is that we should see a lower frequency of local adaptation being detected in studies that remove these interactions. And this is totally not what we found. So uh, no matter how we slice the data, um, certainly for the temperate zone, there was no indication that biotic interactions were generally driving local adaptation. This result is super surprising, um, both because of our own personal like, beliefs in the power of local adaptation as co-authors, but also because within this data set, we um, could detect a strong fitness effect of interactions in the temperate zone. So we have this weird result where uh, interactions are strongly affecting fitness, but they don't seem to be systematically driving local adaptation. Uh, if you can't think of anything else to ask me about in the question period, ask me about this one. Um, it's still a bit of a puzzle. So uh, we find this weird pattern, but we also find that there's an interaction between the latitudinal zone where the study is done and the effect of removing interactions on the signal of local adaptation. So when we look at our tropical data, the first thing to point out is how little we have. So we did do our literature search in both uh, English and Spanish, but we still only found 13 studies that met our inclusion criteria. So we really don't have the type of rich data that we need to make robust conclusions about local, adapt local adaptation in the tropics. That said, from these 13 studies, we see much more of the pattern that we expected where studies that leave interactions in, uh, intact are detecting local adaptation more often than those that are ameliorating them. Although this is not significant, obviously our data suffers from a sample size problem. 
So uh, we get a surprisingly weak signal of interactions affecting local adaptation overall. Um, but from the data that we can find, it does seem to do so more commonly in the tropics as predicted. So the third study that I will tell you about is um, this assessment of how often biotic interactions contribute to species distributions and whether they do so more often at species warm range limits. So this study uh, is a systematic review of the causes of species um, range limits where we scoured the literature for any study that assessed any biotic or abiotic factor and its importance at a species cool, so high latitude or high elevation, or warm, so low latitude or low, ele uh, low elevation range limit. We found uh, about a thousand assessments um, of each type of range limit. The data are um, relatively well distributed geographically, although they're definitely um, more dense in the area where the data are almost always more dense in meta-analyses. Uh, and we found about 500 tests or assessments of biotic factors and almost three times that many assessments of abiotic factors. So um, as a community of people interested in range limits, we are spending way more time and effort assessing the importance of abiotic factors, um, which I, I would argue we understand relatively well versus the effect of biotic factors, which I would argue we understand relatively less well. Um, so what I'm gonna tell you about today is just this result. So just the results for the biotic factors. And so here on the y-axis is the um, probability that biotic factors influence a given range limit. So we, um, for every factor that was assessed, we just scored it as influencing that range limit or not according to the study results. So first I'm gonna show you just the complete data set, all different types of studies, um, field experiments, lab experiments, models. And of course, the prediction from Darwin is that we should be getting a stronger influence of interactions in the warm range limit uh, and a less, a weaker influence of the cool range limit. And unlike the last study, that is exactly what we find. So uh, um, interactions are more important at species warm range limits than species cool limits. Um, and in fact, interactions are supported more than 50% of the time that they're tested at warm limits. Um, as a field biologist, uh, I'm well aware that not all types of studies are equally able to establish causation. So we also looked just at field experiments that are um, less reliant on correlation um, to, to assess the importance of different factors. And we find um, the same pattern, but even stronger. So um, there is a ton of work left to be done on this four question, minutes, but okay. know, um, what I think, I think these initial results um, are really encouraging um, in that we have these different data sets, um, different methods, but they are so far relatively consistent in that um, we are seeing a signal that interactions are predictably stronger in some ecosystems than others. And this is nice because it gives us um, a starting place for where we should be looking to, um, to collect the next generation of data. This is just a plug for students in my lab that are working on uh, related questions. You can find out more about their projects on my website. And if there's any time left, I'm happy to answer questions. Great, yeah, we have a couple minutes left. Um... So we have a question from Easton. Uh, how, often, how often does local adaptation occur if it's not, so how often local adaptation occurs is not affected by latitude, but the strength of local adaptation that would occur already is affected by latitude? Or in other words, um, so whether or not local adaptation occurs is not affected by latitude, but the strength of local adaptation that does occur is affected by latitude? Uh, so I'm not, um, I think that might be just a request for a clarification. I'm not sure, but what I can tell you is that uh, I didn't show any data about the strength of local adaptation. 
but we don't um, we don't actually pick up the same signal uh, in the measure that we used for strength. So we get that difference between um, the temperate zone and the tropics is only significant when we look at the um, the frequency of local adaptation. So, uh, and again, I think this really comes down to sample size um, because our ability to pick out patterns is limited by the amount of tropical data that we have. Did you notice any sort of indication that there was publication bias in terms of when people found local adaptation? And I know you had the slide that was like, if you have nothing else to ask, ask about the slide, but that's, that's kind of what I was really curious about is in that slide, it seems like that could possibly explain the pattern or at least yeah I mean so we did the standard like meta-analysis funnel plot um, and we didn't detect a publication bias in you know in studies that were um, more likely to be published if they found local adaptation or found stronger local adaptation but I thought about this a lot and I actually think that we are super biased as a community in when and where we look for local adaptation so, you know, if a grad student comes to you and says, I really want to work on local adaptation, I'm not going to tell them to go pick two random populations. I'm going to tell them to go look for uh, populations where we think there's an underlying difference and test local adaptation there. And the easiest way to see an underlying difference is along an abiotic gradient. So um, I think there's, I don't think there's publication bias once the work is done. But I think there's a huge bias in how we select systems. And so, you know, there's lots of uh, studies that say local adaptation is super important. You know, it's like 75% of the time. And I think that the like caveat that we have to keep in mind is like, we find it 75% of the time where we think that it already happens. Okay, um, that is the right time to call an end to a fantastic talk by Anna. And I'd like to thank everybody who contributed to this session, a uh, series of really fun talks. And it was great to use them as a lead in to uh, the impromptu beer Zoom session that uh, Mike has sent a link to in the comments and presumably on Slack as well. Uh, Mike's unmuted, so I think he has something to add to that. No, no, just it is on the Slack and it'll, of course, the, the chat will disappear in a couple of seconds. So, Slack so under hopefully, um, hopefully we'll see folks there for a beer and uh, then it will be into the natural history uh, trivia thing. So once again, uh, thanks to everybody for participating in the conference, especially to uh, Mike, Mark and other incredible organizers of this insane amount of work went into this uh, very much unheralded, even though I'm heralding it now, it should be heralded much more as I know how much it must take. So thanks everybody, thanks to all the moderators, thanks to the speakers, technical coordinators, um, and just the people who had the, the nerve to, to say we were gonna do this thing. I think that's incredible to, important to recognize them as well, Susan, Dan, and everybody else involved. Okay, um, bye everybody, session ends. Go over to the Zoom beer session uh, and I will see you there at some point. Bye-bye.